Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 1, by Julian Hawthorne, Editor. Section 0. Riddle Stories. Introduction by Julian Hawthorne. When Poe wrote his immortal Dupin tales, the name Detective Stories had not been invented, the detective of fiction not having been as yet discovered, and the title is still something of a misnomer, for many narratives involving a puzzle of some sort, though belonging to the category which I wish to discuss, are handled by the writer without expert detective aid. Sometimes the puzzle solves itself through operation of circumstance. Sometimes somebody who professes no special detective skill happens upon the secret of its mystery. Once in a while some venturesome genius has the courage to leave his enigma unexplained. But ever since Gaborio created his Lecoq, the transcendent detective has been in favor, and Conan Doyle's famous gentleman analyst has given him a fresh lease of life, and reanimated the stage by reverting to the method of Poe. Sherlock Holmes is Dupin Redivivus, and Mutatus Mutandis. Personally, he is a more stirring and engaging companion, but so far as kinship to probabilities or even possibilities is concerned, perhaps the older version of him is the more presentable. But in this age of marvels, we seem less difficult to suit in this respect than our forefathers were. The fact is, meanwhile, that in the riddle story, the detective was an afterthought, or more accurately, a deus ex machina to make the story go. The riddle had to be unriddled, and who could do it so naturally and readily as a detective? The detective, as Poe saw him, was a means to this end, and it was only afterwards that writers perceived his availability as a character. Lecoq accordingly becomes a figure in fiction, and Sherlock Holmes, while he was yet a novelty, was nearly as attractive as the complications in which he involved himself. Riddle story writers in general, however, encounter the obvious embarrassment that their detective is obliged to lavish so much attention on the professional services which the exigencies of the tale demand of him, and he has very little leisure to expound his own personal equation. The rather since the attitude of peering into a millstone is not, of itself, conducive to elucidations of oneself. The professional endowment obscures all the others. We ordinarily find, therefore, our author dismissing the individuality of his detective with a few strong black chalk outlines, and devoting his main labor upon what he feels the reader will chiefly occupy his own ingenuity with, namely the elaboration of the riddle itself. Reader and writer sit down to a game, as it were, with the odds, of course, altogether on the latter's side, apart from the fact that a writer sometimes permits himself a little cheating. It more often happens that the detective appears to be in the writer's pay, and aids the deception by leading the reader off on false scents. Be that as it may, the professional sleuth is in nine cases out of ten a dummy by malice prepense, and it might be plausibly argued that, in the interests of pure art, that is what he ought to be. But genius always finds a way that is better than the rules and I think it will be found that the very best riddle stories contrive to drive character and riddle side by side, and to make each somehow enhance the effect of the other. The intention of the above paragraph will be more precisely conveyed if I include under the name of detective not only the man from the central office, but also anybody whom the writer may, for ends of his own, consider better qualified for that function. The latter is a professional detective, so far as the exigencies of the tale are concerned, and what becomes of him after that nobody need care. There is no longer anything to prevent his becoming, in his own right, the most fascinating of mankind. But in addition to the dummy ship of the detective, or to the cases in which the mere slip of circumstance takes his place, there is another reason against narrowing our conception of the riddle story to the degree which the alternative appellation would imply and that is, that it would exclude not a few of the most captivating riddle stories in existence. For in De Quincey's Avenger, for example, the interest is not in the unraveling of the web, but in the weaving of it. The same remark applies to Bulwer's strange story. It is the strangeness that is the thing. There is, in short, an inalienable charm in the mere contemplation of mystery and the hazard of fortunes 
and it would be a pity to shut them out from our consideration only because there is no second-sided conjurer on hand to turn them into plain matter of fact yet we must not be too liberal and a ghost story can be brought into our charmed and charming circle only if we have made up our minds to believe in the ghosts otherwise their introduction would not be a square deal it would not be fair in other words to propose a conundrum on a basis of ostensible materialism and then when no other key would fit to palm off a disembodied spirit on us tell me beforehand that your scenario is to include both worlds and i have no objection to make i simply attune my mind to the more extensive scope but i rebel at an unheralded ghost land and declare frankly that your tale is incredible and i must confess that i would as lief have ghosts kept out altogether their stories make a very good library in themselves and have no need to tag themselves on to what is really another department of fiction nevertheless when a ghost story is told with the consummate art of a miss wilkins and of one or two others on our list consistency in this regard ceases to be a jewel art proves irresistible as for adventure stories there is a fringe of them that comes under the riddle story head but for the most part the riddle story begins after the adventures have finished we are to contemplate a condition not to watch the events that ultimate in it our detective or anyone else may of course meet with hap and mishaps on his way to the solution of his puzzle but an astute writer will not color such incidents too vividly lest he risk forfeiting our preoccupation with a problem that we came forth for to study in a word one thing at a time the foregoing disquisition may seem uncalled for by such rigid moralists as have made up their minds not to regard detective or riddle stories as any part of respectable literature at all with that sect i announce at the outset that i am entirely out of sympathy it is not needed to compare the gold bug with paradise lost nobody denies the superior literary stature of the latter although as the oxford senior wrangler objected what does it prove but i appeal to emerson who in his poem of the mountain and the squirrel states the nub of the argument with incomparable felicity as follows you will recall that the two protagonists had a difference originating in the fact that the former called the latter little prig bun made a very sprightly retort summing up to this effect talents differ all is well and wisely put if i cannot carry forests on my back neither can you crack a nut andes and paradise lost are expedient and perhaps necessary in their proper atmosphere and function but squirrels and gold bugs are indispensable in our daily walk there is as fine and as true literature in pose tales as in milton's epics only the elevation and dimensions differ but i would rather live in a world that possessed only literature of the poe caliber than shiver in one echoing solely the strains of the miltonian muse mere human beings are not constructed to stand all day a tiptoe on the misty mountain tops they like to walk the streets most of the time and sit in easy chairs and writings that picture the human mind and nature in true colors and in artistic proportions are literature and nobody has any business to pooh-pooh them in fact i feel as if i were knocking down a man of straw i look in vain for any genuine resistance of course the gold bug is literature of course any other story of mystery and puzzle is also literature provided it is as good as the gold bug or i will say since that standard has never since been quite attained provided it is a half or a tenth as good it is goldsmith's work it is chinese carving it is dadlian it is fine it is the product of the ingenuity lobe of the human brain working and expatiating in freedom it is art not spiritual or transcendental art but solid art to be felt and experienced you may examine it at your leisure it will always be ready for you you need not fast or watch your arms overnight in order to understand it look at the nice setting of the mortises mark how the cover fits how smooth is the working of that spring drawer observe that this bit of carving which seemed mere ornament is really a vital part of the mechanism note moreover how balanced and symmetrical the whole design is with what economy and foresight every part is fashioned 
it is not only an ingenious structure it is a handsome bit of furniture and will materially improve the looks of the empty chambers or disorderly or ungainly chambers that you carry under your crown or if it happens that these apartments are noble in decoration and proportions then this captivating little object will find a suitable place in some spare nook or other and will rest or entertain eyes too long focused on the severely sublime and beautiful i need not however rely upon abstract argument to support my contention many of the best writers of all time have used their skill in the inverted form of storytelling as a glance at our table of contents will show and many of their tales depend for their effect as much on character and atmosphere as on the play and complication of events the statement that a good detective or riddle story is good in art is supported by the fact that the supply of really good ones is relatively small while the number of writers who would write good ones if they could and who have tried and failed to write them is past computation and one reason probably is that such stories for their success must depend primarily upon structure a sound and perfect plot which is one of the rare things in our contemporary fiction our writers get hold of an incident or a sentiment or a character or a moral principle or a bit of technical knowledge or splotch of local color or even a new version or dialect and they will do something in two or ten thousand words out of that and call it a short story magazines may be found to print it for there are all manner of magazines but nothing of that sort will serve for a riddle story you cannot make a riddle story by beginning it and then trusting to luck to bring it to an end you must know all about the end and the middle before thinking even of the beginning the beginning of a riddle story unlike those of other stories and of other enterprises is not half the battle it is next to being quite unimportant and moreover it is always easy the unexplained corpse lies weltering in its gore in the first paragraph the inexplicable cipher presents its enigma at the turning of the opposite page the writer who is secure in the knowledge that he has got a good thing coming and has arranged the manner and details of its coming cannot go far wrong with his exordium he wants to get into action at once and that is his best assurance that he will do it in the right way but oh what a labor and a sweat it is what a planning and trimming what a remodeling curtailing interlining what despairs succeeded by new lights what heroic expedients tried at the last moment and dismissed the moment after what waste paper baskets full of futilities and what gallant commencements all over again did the reader know or remotely suspect what terrific struggles the writer of a really good detective story has sustained he would regard the final product with a new wonder and respect and read it all over once more to find out how the troubles occurred but he will search in vain there are no signs of them left no not so much as a scar the tale moves along as smoothly and inevitably as oiled machinery obviously it could not have been arranged otherwise than it is and the wise reader is convinced that he could have done the thing himself without half trying at that the writer smiles a bitter smile but it is one of the spurns that patient merit of the unworthy takes nobody except him who has tried it will ever know how hard it is to write a really good detective story the man or woman who can do it can also write a good play according to modern ideas of plays and possesses force of character individuality and mental ability he or she must combine the intuition of the artist with the talent of the master mechanic but will seldom be a poet and will generally care more for things and events than for fellow creatures for although the story is often concerned with righting some wrong or avenging some murder yet it must be confessed that the author commonly succeeds better in the measure of his ruthlessness in devising crimes and giving his portraits of devils an extra touch of black mercy is not his strong point however he may abound in justice and he will not stickle at piling up the agony if thereby he provides opportunity for enhancing the picturesqueness and completeness of the evil doer's due but this leads me to the admission that one charge at least does lie against the door of the riddle story writer and that is that he is not sincere he makes his mysteries backward and knows the answer to his riddle before he states its terms he deliberately supplies his reader also with all manner of false scents 
well knowing them to be such, and concocts various seeming artless and innocent remarks and allusions which in reality are diabolically artful, and would deceive the very elect. All this, I say, must be conceded, but it is not unfair. The very object, ostensibly, of the riddle story is to prompt you to sharpen your wits. And as you are yourself the real detective in the case, so you must regard your author as the real criminal whom you are to detect. Credit no statement of his save as supported by the clearest evidence, to be continually repeated to yourself, Timeo Daneos et Dona Ferentis, nay, never so much as then. But, as I said before, when the game is well set, you have no chance whatever against the dealer. And for my own part, I never try to be clever when I go up against these thimble-riggers. I believe all they tell me, and accept the most insolent gold bricks. And in that way, I occasionally catch some of the very ablest of them napping, for they are so subtle that they will sometimes tell you the truth because they think you will suppose it to be a lie. I do not wish to catch them napping, however. I cling to the wisdom of ignorance and childishly enjoy the way in which things work themselves out, the cul-de-sac resolving itself at the very last moment into a promising corridor towards the outer air. At every rebuff, it is my happiness to be hopelessly bewildered, and I gape with admiration when the Gordian knot is untied. If the author be old-fashioned enough to apostrophize the gentle reader, I know he must mean me, and docilely give ear, and presently tumble head foremost into the treacherous pit he has digged for me. In brief, I am there to be sold, and I get my money's worth. No one can thoroughly enjoy riddle stories unless he is old enough, or young enough, or at any rate wise enough to appreciate the value of the faculty of being surprised. Those sardonic and omniscient persons who know everything beforehand, and smile compassionately or scornfully at the artless outcries of astonishment of those who are uninformed, may get an ill-natured satisfaction out of the persuasion that they are superior beings. But there is very little meat in that sort of happiness, and the uninformed have the better lot after all. I need hardly point out that there is a distinction and a difference between short riddle stories and longer ones, novels. The former require far more technical art for their proper development. The enigma cannot be posed in so many ways, but must be stated once for all. There cannot be false sense, or but a few of them. There can be small opportunity for character drawing, and all kinds of ornament and comment must be reduced to their very lowest terms. Here, indeed, as everywhere, genius will have its way, and while a merely talented writer would deem it impossible to tell the story of The Gold Bug in less than a volume, Poe could do it in a few thousand words, and yet appear to have said everything worth saying. In the case of the Sherlock Holmes tales, they form a series, and our previous knowledge of the hero enables the writer to dispense with much description and accompaniment that would be necessary had that eminent personage been presented in only a single complication of events. Each special episode of the great analyst's career can therefore be handled with the utmost economy, and yet fill all the requirements of intelligent interest and comprehension. But as a rule, the riddle novel approaches its theme in a spirit essentially other than that which inspires the short tale. We are given, as it were, a wide landscape instead of a detailed genre picture. The number of the dramatis personae is much larger, and the parts given to many of them may be very small, though each should have his or her necessary function in the general plan. It is much easier to create perplexity on these terms, but on the other hand, the riddle novel demands a power of vivid character portrayal and of telling description which are not indispensable in the briefer narrative. A famous tale, published perhaps forty years ago, but which cannot be included in our series, tells the story of a murder, the secret of which is admirably concealed till the very last. And much of the fascination of the book is due to the ability with which the leading character and some of the subordinate ones are drawn. The author was a woman, and I have often marveled that women so seldom attempt this form of literature. Many of them possess a good constructive faculty, and their love of detail and of mystery is notorious. Perhaps they are too fond of sentiment, and sentiment must be handled with caution in riddle stories. The fault of all riddle novels is that they inevitably involve two kinds of interest, and can seldom balance these so perfectly 
that one or the other of them shall not suffer. The mind of the reader becomes weary in its frequent journeys between human characters on one side, the mysterious events on the other, and would prefer the more single-eyed treat of the short tale. Wonder, too, is a very tender and short-lived emotion, and sometimes perishes after a few pages. Curiosity is tougher, but that too may be baffled too long, and end by tiring of the pursuit while it is yet in its early stages. Many excellent plots, admirable from the constructive point of view, have been wasted by stringing them out too far. The reader recognizes their merit, but loses his enthusiasm on account of a sort of monotony of strain. He wickedly turns to the concluding chapter, and the game is up. The Woman in White, by Wilkie Collins, was published about 1860, I think, in weekly installments, and certainly they were devoured with insatiable appetite by many thousands of readers. But I doubt whether a book of similar merit could command such a following today. And I will even confess that I have myself never read the concluding parts, and do not know to this day who the woman was, or what were the wrongs from which she so poignantly suffered. The tales contained in the volumes herewith offered are the best riddle or detective stories in the world, according to the best judgment of the editors. They are the product of writers of all nations, and translation, in this case, is less apt to be misleading than with most other forms of literature, for a mystery or a riddle is equally captivating in all languages. Many of the good ones, perhaps some of the best ones, have been left out, either because we missed them in our search, or because we had to choose between them and others seemingly of equal excellence, and were obliged to consider space limitations which, however generously laid out, must have some end at last. Be that as it may, we believe that there are good enough stories here to satisfy the most gargantuan hunger, and we feel sure that our volumes will never be crowded off the shelf which has once made room for them. If we have now and then a little transcended the strict definition of the class of fiction which our title would promise, we shall nevertheless not anticipate any serious quarrel with our readers, if there be room to question the right of any given story to appear in this company, there will be all the more reason for accepting it on its own merits, for it had to be very good indeed in order to overcome its technical disqualification. And if it did not rightfully belong there, there would probably be objections as strong to admitting it in any other collection. Between two or more stools, it would be a pity to let it fall to the ground, so let it be forgiven and please us with whatever gift it has. In many cases where copyrights were still unexpired, we have to express our acknowledgments to writers and publishers who have accorded us the courtesy of their leave to reproduce what their genius or enterprise has created and put forth. To our readers, we take pleasure in presenting what we know cannot fail to give them pleasure, a collection of the fruits of the finest literary ingenuity and nicest art accessible to the human mind. Gaudeat non caveat emptor. Julian Hawthorne End of Section 0「Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 1, by Julian Hawthorne, Editor, Section 1 American Mystery Stories By the Waters of Paradise, by Francis Marion Crawford Part 1 I remember my childhood very distinctly. I do not think that the fact argues a good memory, for I have never been clever at learning words by heart in prose or rhyme, so that I believe my remembrance of events depends much more upon the events themselves than upon my possessing any special facility for recalling them. Perhaps I am too imaginative, and the earliest impressions I received were of a kind to stimulate the imagination abnormally. A long series of little misfortunes, so connected with each other as to suggest a sort of weird fatality, so worked upon my melancholy temperament when I was a boy that before I was of age, I sincerely believed myself to be under a curse, and not only myself, but my whole family, and every individual who bore my name. I was born in the old place where my father, and his father, and all his predecessors had been born, beyond the memory of man. It is a very old house, and the greater part of it was originally a castle, strongly fortified, and surrounded by a deep moat supplied with abundant water from the hills by a hidden aqueduct. 
Many of the fortifications have been destroyed, and the moat has been filled up. The water from the aqueduct supplies great fountains, and runs down into huge oblong basins in the terraced gardens, one below the other, each surrounded by a broad pavement of marble between the water and the flower beds. The waste surplus finally escapes through an artificial grotto, some thirty yards long, into a stream flowing down through the park to the meadows beyond, and thence to the distant river. The buildings were extended a little, and greatly altered, more than two hundred years ago, in the time of Charles the Second, but since then little has been done to improve them, though they have been kept in fairly good repair, according to our fortunes. In the gardens there are terraces and huge hedges of box and evergreen, some of which used to be clipped into shapes of animals in the Italian style. I can remember when I was a lad how I used to try to make out what the trees were cut to represent, and how I used to appeal for explanations to Judith, my Welsh nurse. She dealt in a strange mythology of her own, and peopled the gardens with griffins, dragons, good genii and bad, and filled my mind with them at the same time. My nursery window afforded a view of the great fountains at the head of the upper basin, and on moonlit nights the Welsh woman would hold me up to the glass and bid me look at the mist and spray rising into mysterious shapes, moving mystically in the white light like living things. It's the woman of the water, she used to say, and sometimes she would threaten that if I did not go to sleep, the woman of the water would steal up to the high window and carry me away in her wet arms. The place was gloomy. The broad basins of water and the tall evergreen hedges gave it a funereal look, and the damp stained marble causeways by the pools might have been made of tombstones. The gray and weather-beaten walls and towers without the dark and massively furnished rooms within, the deep, mysterious recesses and the heavy curtains, all affected my spirits. I was silent and sad from my childhood. There was a great clock tower above, from which the hours rang dismally during the day, and tolled like a knell in the dead of night. There was no light nor life in the house, for my mother was a helpless invalid, and my father had grown melancholy in his long task of caring for her. He was a thin, dark man, with sad eyes, kind, I think, but silent and unhappy. Next to my mother, I believe he loved me better than anything on earth, for he took immense pains and trouble in teaching me, and what he taught me I have never forgotten. Perhaps it was his only amusement, and that may be the reason why I had no nursery governess or teacher of any kind while he lived. I used to be taken to see my mother every day, and sometimes twice a day, for an hour at a time. Then I sat upon a little stool near her feet, and she would ask me what I had been doing, and what I wanted to do. I dare say she saw already the seeds of a profound melancholy in my nature, for she looked at me always with a sad smile, and kissed me with a sigh when I was taken away. One night, when I was just six years old, I lay awake in the nursery. The door was not quite shut, and the Welsh nurse was sitting sewing in the next room. Suddenly I heard her groan and say in a strange voice, One, two, one, two. I was frightened, and I jumped up and ran to the door, barefooted as I was. What is it, Judith? I cried, clinging to her skirts. I can remember the look in her strange dark eyes as she answered, One, Two leaden coffins fallen from the ceiling, she crooned, working herself in her chair. One, two, a light coffin and a heavy coffin falling to the floor. Then she seemed to notice me, and she took me back to bed and sang me to sleep with a queer old Welsh song. I do not know how it was, but the impression got hold of me that she had meant that my father and mother were going to die very soon. They died in the very room where she had been sitting that night. It was a great room, my day nursery, full of sun when there was any, and when the days were dark it was the most cheerful place in the house. My mother grew rapidly worse, and I was transferred to another part of the building to make place for her. They thought my nursery was gayer for her, I suppose, but she could not live. 
She was beautiful when she was dead, and I cried bitterly. The light one, the light one, the heavy one to come, crooned the Welsh woman, and she was right. My father took the room after my mother was gone, and day by day he grew thinner and paler and sadder. The heavy one, the heavy one, all of lead, moaned my nurse one night in December, standing still just as she was going to take away the light after putting me to bed. Then she took me up again and wrapped me in a little gown and led me away to my father's room. She knocked, but no one answered. She opened the door, and we found him in his easy chair before the fire, very white, quite dead. So I was alone with the Welsh woman, till strange people came, and relations whom I had never seen, and then I heard them saying that I must be taken away to some more cheerful place. They were kind people, and I will not believe that they were kind only because I was to be very rich when I grew to be a man. The world never seemed to be a very bad place for me, nor all the people to be miserable sinners, even when I was most melancholy. I do not remember that anyone ever did me any great injustice, nor that I was ever oppressed or ill-treated in any way, even by the boys at school. I was sad, I suppose, because my childhood was so gloomy, and later because I was unlucky in everything I undertook, till I finally believed I was pursued by fate, and I used to dream that the old Welsh nurse and the woman of the water between them had vowed to pursue me to my end. But my natural disposition should have been cheerful, as I have often thought. Among the lads of my age I was never last, or even among the last, in anything, but I was never first. If I trained for a race, I was sure to sprain my ankle on the day when I was to run. If I pulled an oar with others, my oar was sure to break. If I competed for a prize, some unforeseen accident prevented my winning it at the last moment. Nothing to which I put my hand succeeded, and I got the reputation of being unlucky, until my companions felt it was always safe to bet against me, no matter what the appearances might be. I became discouraged and listless in everything. I gave up the idea of competing for any distinction at the university, comforting myself with the thought that I could not fail in the examination for the ordinary degree. The day before the examination began, I fell ill, and when at last I recovered, after a narrow escape from death, I turned my back upon Oxford and went down alone to visit the old place where I had been born, feeble in health and profoundly disgusted and discouraged. I was twenty-one years of age, master of myself and of my fortune, but so deeply had the long chain of small unlucky circumstances affected me that I thought seriously of shutting myself up from the world to live the life of a hermit and to die as soon as possible. Death seemed the only cheerful possibility in my existence, and my thoughts soon dwelt upon it altogether. I had never shown any wish to return to my own home since I had been taken away as a little boy, and no one had ever pressed me to do so. The place had been kept in order, after a fashion, and did not seem to have suffered during the fifteen years or more of my absence. Nothing earthly could affect those old gray walls that had fought the elements for so many centuries. The garden was more wild than I remembered it. The marble causeways about the pool looked more yellow and damp than of old, and the whole place at first looked smaller. It was not until I had wandered about the house and grounds for many hours that I realized the huge size of the home where I was to live in solitude. Then I began to delight in it, and my resolution to live alone grew stronger. The people had turned out to welcome me, of course, and I tried to recognize the changed faces of the old gardener and the old housekeeper, and to call them by name. My old nurse I knew at once. She had grown very gray since she heard the coffins fall in the nursery fifteen years before. But her strange eyes were the same, and the look in them woke all my old memories. She went over the house with me. "'And how is the woman of the water?' I asked, trying to laugh a little. "'Does she still play in the moonlight?' "'She is hungry,' 
answered the Welshwoman in a low voice. Hungry? Then we will feed her, I laughed. But old Judith turned very pale and looked at me strangely. Feed her? Aye, you will feed her well, she muttered, glancing behind her at the ancient housekeeper who tottered after us with feeble steps through the halls and passages. I did not think much of her words. She had always talked oddly, as Welsh women will, and though I was very melancholy, I am sure I was not superstitious, and I was certainly not timid. Only, as if in a far-off dream, I seemed to see her standing with the light in her hand, and muttering, The heavy one, all of lead, and then leading a little boy through the long corridors to see his father lying dead in a great easy chair before a smoldering fire. So we went over the house, and I chose the rooms where I would live, and the servants I had brought with me ordered and arranged everything, and I had no more trouble. I did not care what they did, provided I was left in peace, and was not expected to give directions, for I was more listless than ever, owing to the effects of my illness at college. I dined in solitary state, and the melancholy grandeur of the vast old dining room pleased me. Then I went to the room I had selected for my study, and sat down in a deep chair under a bright light, to think, or to let my thoughts meander through labyrinths of their own choosing, utterly indifferent to the course they might take. The tall windows of the room opened to the level of the ground upon the terrace at the head of the garden. It was in the end of July, and everything was open, for the weather was warm. As I sat alone, I heard the unceasing splash of the great fountains, and I fell to thinking of the woman of the water. I rose and went out into the still night, and sat down upon a seat on the terrace between two gigantic Italian flower pots. The air was deliciously soft and sweet with the smell of the flowers, and the garden was more congenial to me than the house. Sad people always like running water and the sound of it at night, though I cannot tell why. I sat and listened in the gloom, for it was dark below, and the pale moon had not yet climbed over the hills in front of me, though the air all above was light with their rising beams. Slowly the white halo in the eastern sky ascended in an arch above the wooded crests, making the outlines of the mountains more intensely black by contrast, as though the head of some great white saint were rising from behind a screen in a vast cathedral, throwing misty glories from below. I longed to see the moon herself, and I tried to reckon the seconds before she must appear. Then she sprang up quickly, and in a moment more hung round and perfect in the sky. I gazed at her, and then at the floating spray of the tall fountains, and down at the pools where the water lilies were rocking softly in their sleep on the velvet surface of the moonlit water. Just then a great swan floated out silently into the midst of the basin and wreathed his long neck, catching the water in his broad bill and scattering showers of diamonds around him. Suddenly, as I gazed, something came between me and the light. I looked up instantly. Between me and the round disk of the moon rose a luminous face of a woman with great strange eyes and a woman's mouth full and soft but not smiling, hooded in black, staring at me as I sat still upon my bench. She was close to me, so close that I could have touched her with my hand, but I was transfixed and helpless. She stood still for a moment, but her expression did not change. Then she passed swiftly away, and my hair stood up on my head while the cold breeze from her white dress was wafted to my temples as she moved. The moonlight, shining through the tossing spray of the fountain, made traceries of shadow on the gleaming folds of her garments. In an instant she was gone, and I was alone. I was strangely shaken by the vision, and some time passed before I could rise to my feet, for I was still weak from my illness, and the sight that I had seen would have startled anyone. I did not reason with myself, for I was certain that I had looked on the unearthly, and no argument could have destroyed that belief. At last I got up and stood unsteadily, gazing in the direction which I thought the face had gone, 
but there was nothing to be seen, nothing but the broad paths, the tall, dark, evergreen hedges, the tossing water of the fountains, and the smooth pool below. I fell back upon the seat and recalled the face I had seen. Strange to say, now that the first impression had passed, there was nothing startling in the recollection. On the contrary, I felt that I was fascinated by the face, and would give anything to see it again. I could retrace the beautiful straight features, the long, dark eyes, and the wonderful mouth most exactly in my mind. And when I had reconstructed every detail from memory, I knew that the whole was beautiful, and that I should love a woman with such a face. I wonder whether she's the woman of the water, I said to myself. Then, rising once more, I wandered down the garden, descending one short flight of steps after another, from terrace to terrace by the edge of the marble basins, through the shadow and through the moonlight, and I crossed the water by the rustic bridge above the artificial grotto, and climbed slowly up again to the highest terrace by the other side. The air seemed sweeter, and I was very calm, so that I think I smiled to myself as I walked, as though a new happiness had come to me. The woman's face seemed always before me, and the thought of it gave me an unwanted thrill of pleasure, unlike anything I had ever felt before. I turned as I reached the house, and looked back upon the scene. It had certainly changed in the short hour since I had come out, and my mood had changed with it. Just like my luck, I thought, to fall in love with a ghost. But in old times I would have sighed, and gone to bed more sad than ever at such a melancholy conclusion. Tonight I felt happy, almost for the first time in my life. The gloomy old study seemed cheerful when I went in. The old pictures on the walls smiled at me, and I sat down in my deep chair with a new and delightful sensation that I was not alone. The idea of having seen a ghost, and of feeling much the better for it, was so absurd that I laughed softly and I took up one of the books that I had brought with me and began to read. That impression did not wear off. I slept peacefully, and in the morning I threw open my windows to the summer air and looked down at the garden, at the stretches of green and at the colored flower beds, at the circling swallows and at the bright water. A man might make a paradise of this place, I exclaimed, a man and a woman together. From that day the old castle no longer seemed gloomy, and I think I ceased to be sad. For some time, too, I began to take an interest in the place, and to try and make it more alive. I avoided my old Welsh nurse, lest she should damp my humor with some dismal prophecy, and recall my old self by bringing back memories of my dismal childhood. But what I thought of most was the ghostly figure I had seen in the garden that first night after my arrival. I went out every evening and wandered through the walks and paths, but try as I might, I did not see my vision again. At last, after many days, the memory grew more faint, and my old moody nature gradually overcame the temporary sense of lightness I had experienced. The summer turned to autumn, and I grew restless. It began to rain. The dampness pervaded the gardens, and the outer halls smelled musty like tombs. The gray sky oppressed me intolerably. I left the place as it was, and went abroad, determined to try anything which might possibly make a second break in the monotonous melancholy from which I suffered. End of section one. Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume One, by Julian Hawthorne, Editor. Section 2. By the Waters of Paradise. By Julian Hawthorne. Part 2. Most people would be struck by the utter insignificance of the small events which, after the death of my parents, influenced my life and made me unhappy. The gruesome forebodings of a Welsh nurse, which chanced to be realized by an odd coincidence of events, should not seem enough to change the nature of a child and to direct the bent of his character in after years. The little disappointments of schoolboy life 
and the somewhat less childish ones of an uneventful and undistinguished academic career, should not have sufficed to turn me out at one and twenty years of age, a melancholic, listless idler. Some weakness of my own character may have contributed to the result, but in a greater degree it was due to my having a reputation for bad luck. However, I will not try to analyze the causes of my state, for I should satisfy nobody, least of all myself. Still less will I attempt to explain why I felt a temporary revival of my spirits after my adventure in the garden. It is certain that I was in love with the face I had seen, and that I longed to see it again, that I gave up all hope of a second visitation, grew more sad than ever, packed up my traps, and finally went abroad. But in my dreams I went back to my home, and it always appeared to me sunny and bright, as it had looked on that summer's morning after I had seen the woman by the fountain. I went to Paris. I went farther, and wandered about Germany. I tried to amuse myself, and I failed miserably. With the aimless whims of an idle and useless man come all sorts of suggestions for good resolutions. One day I made up my mind that I would go and bury myself in a German university for a time, and live simply like a poor student. I started with the intention of going to Leipzig, determined to stay there until some event should direct my life or change my humor, or make an end of me altogether. The express train stopped at some station of which I did not know the name. It was dusk on a winter's afternoon, and I peered through the thick glass from my seat. Suddenly another train came gliding in from the opposite direction and stopped alongside of ours. I looked at the carriage, which chanced to be abreast of mine, and idly read the black letters painted on a white board, swinging from the brass handrail. Berlin, Cologne, Paris. Then I looked up at the window above. I started violently, and the cold perspiration broke out on my forehead. In the dim light, not six feet from where I sat, I saw the face of a woman, the face I loved, the straight, fine features, the strange eyes, the wonderful mouth, the pale skin. Her headdress was a dark veil, which seemed to be tied about her head and passed over the shoulders under her chin. As I threw down the window and knelt on the cushion seat, leaning far out to get a better view, a long whistle screamed through the station, followed by a quick series of dull clanking sounds. Then there was a slight jerk, and my train moved on. Luckily, the window was narrow, being the one over the seat, beside the door, or I believe I would have jumped out of it then and there. In an instant the speed increased, and I was being carried swiftly away in the opposite direction from the thing I loved. For a quarter of an hour I lay back in my place, stunned by the suddenness of the apparition. At last one of the two other passengers, a large and gorgeous captain of the white Königsberg Cuirassiers, civilly but firmly suggested that I might shut my window, as the evening was cold. I did so with an apology, and relapsed into silence. The train ran swiftly on for a long time, and it was already beginning to lack in speed before entering another station, when I roused myself and made a sudden resolution. As the carriage stopped before the brilliantly lighted platform, I seized my belongings, saluted my fellow passengers, and got out determined to take the first express back to Paris. This time the circumstances of the vision had been so natural that it did not strike me that there was anything unreal about the face or about the woman to whom it belonged. I did not try to explain to myself how the face and the woman could be traveling by a fast train from Berlin to Paris on a winter's afternoon, when both were in my mind indelibly associated with the moonlight and the fountains in my old English home. I certainly would not have admitted that I had been mistaken in the dark, attributing to what I had seen a resemblance to my former vision which did not really exist. There was not the slightest doubt in my mind, and I was positively sure that I had again seen the face I loved. I did not hesitate, and in a few hours I was on my way back to Paris. I could not help reflecting on my ill luck. Wandering as I had been for many months, it might as easily have chanced that I should be traveling in the same train with that woman, instead of going the other way. But my luck was destined to turn for a time. 
I searched Paris for several days. I dined at the principal hotels. I went to the theaters. I rode in the Bois de Boulogne in the morning and picked up an acquaintance whom I forced to drive with me in the afternoon. I went to Mass at the Madeleine, and I attended the services at the English church. I hung about the Louvre and Notre Dame. I went to Versailles. I spent hours in parading the Rue de Rivoli in the neighborhood of Maurice's Corner, where foreigners pass and repass from morning till night. At last, I received an invitation to a reception at the English embassy. I went, and I found what I had sought so long. There she was, sitting by an old lady in gray satin and diamonds, who had a wrinkled but kindly face and keen gray eyes that seemed to take in everything they saw, with very little inclination to give much in return. But I did not notice the chaperone. I saw only the face that had haunted me for months, and in the excitement of the moment I walked quickly towards the pair, forgetting such a trifle as the necessity for an introduction. She was far more beautiful than I had thought, but I never doubted that it was she herself and no other. Vision or no vision before, this was the reality, and I knew it. Twice her hair had been covered, now at last I saw it, and the added beauty of its magnificence glorified the whole woman. It was rich hair, fine and abundant, golden with deep ruddy tints in it like red bronze spun fine. There was no ornament in it, not a rose, not a thread of gold, and I felt that it needed nothing to enhance its splendor, nothing but her pale face, her dark, strange eyes, and her heavy eyebrows. I could see that she was slender, too, but strong withal, as she sat there quietly gazing at the moving scene in the midst of the brilliant lights and the hum of perpetual conversation. I recollected the detail of introduction in time, and turned aside to look for my host. I found him at last. I begged him to present me to the two ladies, pointing them out to him at the same time. "'Yes, uh, by all means,' uh, replied His Excellency, with a pleasant smile. He evidently had no idea of my name, which was not to be wondered at. "'I am Lord Cangorm,' I observed. "'Oh, by all means,' answered the ambassador, with the same hospitable smile. "'Yes, uh, the fact is, I must try to find out who they are. Such lots of people, you know.' "'Oh, if you will present me, I will try and find out for you,' I said, laughing. "'Ah, yes, so kind of you. Come along,' said my host." We threaded the crowd, and in a few moments we stood before the two ladies. "'Allow me to introduce Lord Camgorn,' he said. Then, adding quickly to me, "'Come and dine tomorrow, won't you?' He glided away with his pleasant smile and disappeared in the crowd. I sat down beside the beautiful girl, conscious that the eyes of the duenna were upon me. "'I think we have been very near meeting before,' I remarked, by way of opening the conversation." My companion turned her eyes full upon me with an air of inquiry. She evidently did not recall my face, if she had ever seen me. Really, I cannot remember, she observed, in a low and musical voice. When? In the first place, you came down from Berlin by the express ten days ago. I was going the other way, and our carriages stopped opposite each other. I saw you at the window. Yes, we came that way, but I do not remember she hesitated. Secondly, I continued, I was sitting alone in my garden last summer, near the end of July, do you remember? You must have wandered in there through the park. You came up to the house and looked at me. Was that you? she asked in evident surprise. Then she broke into a laugh. I told everybody I had seen a ghost. There had never been any cairngorms in the place since the memory of man. We left the next day and never heard that you had come there. Indeed, I did not know the castle belonged to you. Where were you staying? I asked. Where? Why, with my aunt, where I always stay. She's your neighbor, since it is you. I, I beg your pardon, but, but then, is your aunt Lady Bluebell? I did not quite catch. Don't be afraid. She is amazingly deaf. Yes, she is the relict of my beloved uncle, the sixteenth or seventeenth Baron Bluebell, I forget exactly how many of them there have been. And I... Do you know who I am? She laughed, well knowing that I did not. No, I answered frankly. I have not the least idea. 
I asked to be introduced because I recognized you. Perhaps, perhaps you are a Miss Bluebell? Considering that you are a neighbor, I will tell you who I am, she answered. No, I am of the tribe of Bluebells, but my name is Lamas, and I have been given to understand that I was christened Margaret. Being a floral family, they call me Daisy. A dreadful American man once told me that my aunt was a Bluebell, and that I was a Harebell, with two L's and an E, because my hair is so thick. I warn you so that you may avoid making such a bad pun. Do I look like a man who makes puns? I asked being very conscious of my melancholy face and sad looks. Miss Lamas eyed me critically. No, you have a mournful temperament. I think I can trust you, she answered. Do you think you could communicate to my aunt the fact that you are a Cairngorm and a neighbor? I'm sure she would like to know. I leaned toward the old lady, inflating my lungs for a yell. But Miss Lamas stopped me. That is not the slightest use, she remarked. You can write it on a bit of paper. She's utterly deaf. I have a pencil, I answered, but I have no paper. Would my cuff do, do you think? Oh, yes, replied Miss Lamas, with alacrity. Men often do that. I wrote on my cuff, Miss Lamas wishes me to explain that I am your neighbor, Cairngorm. Then I held out my arm before the old lady's nose. She seemed perfectly accustomed to the proceeding, put up her glasses, read the words, smiled, nodded, and addressed me in the unearthly voice peculiar to people who hear nothing. "'I knew your grandfather very well,' she said. Then she smiled and nodded to me again, and to her niece, and relapsed into silence. "'It is all right,' remarked Miss Lamas. "'Aunt Bluebell knows she is deaf, and does not say much like the parrot. You see, she knew your grandfather. How odd that we should be neighbors! Why have we never met before?' If you had told me you knew my grandfather when you appeared in the garden, I should not have been in the least surprised, I answered rather irreverently. I really thought you were the ghost of the old fountain. How in the world did you come there at that hour? We were a large party, and we went out for a walk. Then we thought that we should like to see what your park was like in the moonlight, and so we trespassed. I got separated from the rest, and came upon you by accident, just as I was admiring the extremely ghostly look of your house and wondering whether anybody would ever come and live there again. It looks like the castle of Macbeth, or a scene from the opera. Do you know anybody here? Hardly a soul. Do you? No. Aunt Bluebell said it was our duty to come. It is easy for her to go out. She does not bear the burden of the conversation. I'm sorry you find it a burden, said I. Shall I go away? Miss Lamas looked at me with a sudden gravity in her beautiful eyes and there was a sort of hesitation about the lines of her full, soft mouth. No, she said at last, quite simply, don't go away. We may like each other if you stay a little longer, and we ought to because we're neighbors in the country. I suppose I ought to have thought Miss Lamas a very odd girl. There is, indeed, a sort of freemasonry between people who discover that they live near each other and that they ought to have known each other before but there was a sort of unexpected frankness and simplicity in the girl's amusing manner which would have struck anyone else as being singular, to say the least of it. To me, however, it all seemed natural enough. I had dreamed of her face too long not to be utterly happy when I met her at last, and could talk to her as much as I pleased. To me, the man of ill luck in everything, the whole meeting seemed too good to be true. I felt again the strange sensation of lightness which I had experienced after I had seen her face in the garden. The great room seemed brighter. Life seemed worth living. My sluggish, melancholy blood ran faster, and filled me with a new sense of strength. I said to myself that without this woman I was but an imperfect being, but that with her I could accomplish everything to which I should set my hand. Like the great doctor, when he had thought he had cheated Mephistopheles at last, I could have cried aloud to the fleeting moment, for while doch du bist so schön. Are you always gay? I asked suddenly. How happy you must be. The days would sometimes seem very long if I were gloomy, she answered thoughtfully. Yes, I think I find life very pleasant, and I tell it so. How can you tell life anything? I inquired. If I could catch my life and talk to it, 
I would abuse it prodigiously, I assure you. I dare say. You have a melancholy temper. You ought to live out of doors, dig potatoes, make hay, shoot, hunt, tumble into ditches, and come home muddy and hungry for dinner. It would be much better for you than moping in your rook tower and hating everything. It is rather lonely down there, I murmured, apologetically, feeling that Miss Lamas was quite right. Then marry and quarrel with your wife, she laughed. Anything is better than being alone. I'm a very peaceable person. I never quarrel with anybody. You can try it. You will find it quite impossible. Will you let me try? she asked, still smiling. By all means, especially if it is to be only a preliminary canter, I answered rashly. What do you mean? she inquired, turning quickly upon me. Oh, nothing. You might try my paces with a view to quarreling in the future. I cannot imagine how you are going to do it. You will have to resort to immediate and direct abuse. No, I will only say that if you do not like your life, it is your own fault. How can a man of your age talk of being melancholy, or of the hollowness of existence? Are you consumptive? Are you subject to hereditary insanity? Are you deaf like Aunt Bluebell? Are you poor like lots of people? Have you been crossed in love? Have you lost the world for a woman, or any particular woman, for the sake of the world? Are you feeble-minded, a cripple, an outcast? Are you repulsively ugly? She laughed again. Is there any reason in the world why you should not enjoy all you have got in life? No, there is no reason whatever, except that I am dreadfully unlucky, especially in small things. Then try big things just for a change, suggested Miss Lamas. Try and get married, for instance, and see how it turns out. If it turned out badly, it would be rather serious. Not half so serious as it is to abuse everything unreasonably. If abuse is your particular talent, abuse something that ought to be abused. Abuse the conservatives, or the liberals, it doesn't matter which, since they're always abusing each other. Make yourself felt by other people. You will like it if they don't. It will make a man of you. Fill your mouth with pebbles and howl at the sea if you cannot do anything else. It did Demosthenes no end of good, you know. You'll have the satisfaction of imitating a great man. Really, Miss Lamas, I think the list of innocent exercises you propose. Very well, if you don't care for that sort of thing, care for some other sort of thing. Care for something, or hate something. Don't be idle. Life is short, and though art may be long, plenty of noise answers nearly as well. I do care for something. I mean, somebody, I said. A woman? Then marry her. Don't hesitate. I do not know whether she would marry me, I replied. I've never asked her. Then ask her at once, answered Miss Lamas. I shall die happy if I feel I have persuaded a melancholy fellow creature to rouse himself to action. Ask her by all means and see what she says. If she does not accept you at once, she may take you the next time. Meanwhile, you will have entered the race. If you lose, there are the all-aged trial stakes and the consolation race. And plenty of selling races into the bargain. Shall I take you at your word, Miss Lamas? I hope you will, she answered. Since you yourself advise me, I will. Miss Lamas, will you do me the honor to marry me? For the first time in my life, the blood rushed to my head and my sight swam. I cannot tell why I said it. It would be useless to try to explain the extraordinary fascination the girl exercised over me, or the still more extraordinary feeling of intimacy with her which had grown in me during that half hour. Lonely, sad, unlucky as I had been all my life, I was certainly not timid, nor even shy. But to propose to marry a woman after half an hour's acquaintance was a piece of madness of which I never believed myself capable and of which I should never be capable again, should I be placed in the same situation. It was as though my whole being had been changed in a moment, by magic, by the white magic of her nature brought into contact with mine. The blood sank back into my heart, and a moment later I found myself staring at her with anxious eyes. To my amazement she was as calm as ever, but her beautiful mouth smiled, and there was a mischievous light in her dark brown eyes. Fairly caught, she answered. For an individual who pretends to be listless and sad, you are not lacking in humor. 
I had really not the least idea what you were going to say. Wouldn't it be singularly awkward for you if I had said yes? I never saw anybody begin to practice so sharply what was preached to him, with so very little loss of time. You probably never met a man who had dreamed of you for seven months before being introduced. No, I never did, she answered gaily. It smacks of the romantic. Perhaps you are a romantic character after all. I should think you were if I believed you. Very well, you have taken my advice, entered for a stranger's race, and lost it. Try the all-aged trial stakes. You have another cuff and a pencil. Propose to Aunt Bluebell. She would dance with astonishment, and she might recover her hearing. Part 3 That was how I first asked Margaret Lamas to be my wife, and I will agree with anyone who says that I behaved very foolishly. But I have not repented of it, and I never shall. I have long ago understood that I was out of my mind that evening, but I think my temporary insanity on that occasion has had the effect of making me a saner man ever since. Her manner turned my head, for it was so different from what I had expected. To hear this lovely creature who, in my imagination, was a heroine of romance, if not of tragedy, talking familiarly and laughing readily was more than my equanimity could bear, and I lost my head as well as my heart. But when I went back to England in the spring, I went to make certain arrangements at the castle, certain changes and improvements which would be absolutely necessary. I had won the race for which I had entered myself so rashly, and we were to be married in June. Whether the change was due to the orders I had left with the gardener and the rest of the servants, or to my own state of mind, I cannot tell. At all events, the old place did not look the same to me when I opened my window on the morning after my arrival. There were the gray walls below me, and the gray turrets flanking the huge building. There were the fountains, the marble causeways, the smooth basins, the tall box hedges, the water lilies and the swans, just as of old. But there was something else there, too, something in the air, in the water, and in the greenness that I did not recognize, a light over everything by which everything was transfigured. The clock in the tower struck seven, and the strokes of the ancient bell sounded like a wedding chime. The air sang with a thrilling treble of the songbirds, with the silvery music of the plashing water, and the softer harmony of the leaves stirred by the fresh morning wind. There was a smell of new-mown hay from the distant meadows, and of blooming roses from the beds below, wafted up together to my window. I stood in the pure sunshine and drank the air, and all the sounds and the odors that were in it, and I looked down at my garden and said, It is paradise, after all. I think the men of old were right when they called heaven a garden, and Eden a garden inhabited by one man and one woman, the earthly paradise. I turned away, wondering what had become of the gloomy memories I had always associated with my home. I tried to recall the impression of my nurse's horrible prophecy before the death of my parents, an impression which hitherto had been vivid enough. I tried to remember my old self, my dejection, my listlessness, my bad luck, my petty disappointments. I endeavored to force myself to think as I used to think, if only to satisfy myself that I had not lost my individuality. But I succeeded in none of these efforts. I was a different man, a changed being, incapable of sorrow, of ill luck, or of sadness. My life had been a dream, not evil, but infinitely gloomy and hopeless. It was now a reality, full of hope, gladness, and all manner of good. My home had been like a tomb. Today it was paradise. My heart had been as though it had not existed. Today it beat with strength and youth and the certainty of realized happiness. I reveled in the beauty of the world and called loveliness out of the future to enjoy it before time should bring it to me, as a traveler in the plains looks up to the mountains and already tastes the cool air through the dust of the road. Here, I thought, we will live and live for years. There we will sit by the fountain toward evening and in the deep moonlight. Down those paths we will wander together. On those benches we will rest and talk. Among those eastern hills we will ride through the soft twilight, and in the old house we will tell tales on winter nights, 
when the logs burn high and the holly berries are red and the old clock tolls out the dying year. On these old steps, in these dark passages and stately rooms, there will one day be the sound of little pattering feet, and laughing child voices will ring up to the vaults of the ancient hall. Those tiny footsteps shall not be slow and sad as mine were, nor shall the childish words be spoken in an awed whisper. No gloomy Welshwoman shall people the dusty corners with weird horrors, nor utter horrid prophecies of death and ghastly things. All shall be young and fresh, and joyful and happy, and we will turn the old luck again, and forget that there was ever any sadness. So I thought, as I looked out my window that morning, and for many mornings after that, and every day it all seemed more real than ever before, and much nearer. But the old nurse looked at me askance, and muttered odd sayings about the woman of the water. I cared little what she said, for I was far too happy. At last the time came near for the wedding. Lady Bluebell and all the tribe of the Bluebells, as Margaret called them, were at Bluebell Grange, for we had determined to be married in the country, and to come straight to the castle afterwards. We cared little for traveling, and not at all for a crowded ceremony at St. George's in Hanover Square with all the tiresome formalities afterwards. I used to ride over to the Grange every day, and very often Margaret would come with her aunt and some of her cousins to the castle. I was suspicious of my own taste, and was only too glad to let her have her way about the alterations and improvements in our home. We were to be married on the 30th of July, and on the evening of the 28th, Margaret drove over with some of the Bluebell party. In the long summer twilight we all went out into the garden. Naturally enough, Margaret and I were left to ourselves, and we wandered down by the marble basins. It is an odd coincidence, I said, that it was on this very night last year that I first saw you. Considering that it is the month of July, answered Margaret with a laugh, and that we have been here almost every day, I don't think the coincidence is so extraordinary after all. No, dear, said I, I suppose not. I don't know why it struck me. We shall very likely be here a year from today, and a year after that. The odd thing, when I think of it, is that you should be here at all. But my luck has turned. I ought not to think anything odd that happens now that I have you. It is all sure to be good. A slight change in your ideas since that remarkable performance of yours in Paris, said Margaret. Do you know... I thought you were the most extraordinary man I had ever met. And I thought you were the most charming woman I had ever seen. I naturally did not want to lose any time in frivolities. I took you at your word, and followed your advice. I asked you to marry me, and this is the delightful result. What's the matter? Margaret had started suddenly, and her hand tightened on my arm. An old woman was coming up the path, and was close to us before we saw her for the moon had risen and was shining full in our faces. The woman turned out to be my old nurse. "'It's only Judith, dear. Don't be frightened,' I said. Then I spoke to the Welshwoman. "'What are you about, Judith? Have you been feeding the woman of the water?' "'Aye, when the clock strikes, Willie. My lord, I mean,' muttered the old creature, drawing aside to let us pass, and fixing her strange eyes on Margaret's face. "'What does she mean?' asked Margaret, when we had gone by. Nothing, darling. The old thing is mildly crazy, but she's a good soul. We went on in silence for a few moments, and came to the rustic bridge just above the artificial grotto, through which the water ran out into the park, dark and swift in its narrow channel. We stopped and leaned on the wooden rail. The moon was now behind us, and shone full upon the long vista of basins and on the huge walls and towers of the castle above. "'How proud you are to be of such a grand old place,' said Margaret softly. "'It is yours now, darling,' I answered. "'You have as good a right to love it as I. "'But I only love it because you are to live in it, dear.' "'Her hand stole out and lay on mine, and we were both silent. "'Just then the clock began to strike, far off in the tower. "'I counted. Eight, nine, ten, eleven. I looked at my watch. Twelve. Thirteen. I laughed. The bell went on striking. 
The old clock has gone crazy, like Judith, I exclaimed. Still it went on, note after note ringing out monotonously through the still air. We leaned over the rail, instinctively looking in the direction whence the sound came. On and on it went. I counted nearly a hundred, out of sheer curiosity, for I understood that something had broken, and that the thing was running itself down. Suddenly there was a crack as of breaking wood, a cry, and a heavy splash. And I was alone, clinging to the broken end of the rail of the rustic bridge. I did not think I hesitated while my pulse beat twice. I sprang clear of the bridge into the black rushing water, dived to the bottom, came up again with empty hands, turned and swam downward through the grotto into the thick darkness, plunging and diving at every stroke, striking my head and hands against jagged stones and sharp corners, clutching at last something in my fingers and dragging it up with all my might. I spoke, I cried aloud, but there was no answer. I was alone in the pitchy darkness with my burden, and the house was five hundred yards away. Struggling still, I felt the ground beneath my feet. I saw a ray of moonlight. The grotto widened, and the deep water became a broad and shallow brook as I stumbled over the stones and at last laid Margaret's body on the bank in the park beyond. I Willie, as the clock struck, said the voice of Judith, the Welsh nurse, as she bent down and looked at the white face. The old woman must have turned back and followed us, seen the accident, and slipped out by the lower gate of the garden. Ay, she groaned, you have fed the woman of the water this night, Willie, while the clock was striking. I scarcely heard her as I knelt beside the lifeless body of the woman I loved, chafing the white, wet temples and gazing wildly into the wide, staring eyes. I remember only the first returning look of consciousness, the first heaving breath, the first movement of those dear hands stretching out towards me. That is not much of a story, you say. It's the story of my life, that is all. It does not pretend to be anything else. Old Judith says my luck turned on that summer's night, while I was struggling in the water to save all that was worth living for. A month later there was a stone bridge above the grotto, and Margaret and I stood on it and looked up at the moonlit castle, as we had done once before, and as we have done many times since. For all those things happened ten years ago last summer, and this is the tenth Christmas Eve we have spent together by the roaring logs in the old hall, talking of old times, and every year there are more old times to talk of. There are curly-headed boys, too, with red-gold hair and dark brown eyes like their mother's, and a little Margaret with solemn black eyes like mine. Why could she not look like her mother, too, as well as the rest of them? The world is very bright at this glorious Christmas time, and perhaps there is little use in calling up the sadness of long ago unless it be to make the jolly firelight seem more cheerful, the good wife's face look gladder, and to give the children's laughter a merrier ring, by contrast with all that is gone. Perhaps, too, some sad-faced, listless, melancholy youth, who feels that the world is very hollow and that life is like a perpetual funeral service, just as I used to feel myself, may take courage from my example, and having found the woman of his heart, ask her to marry him after half an hour's acquaintance. But, on the whole, I would not advise any man to marry, for the simple reason that no man will ever find a wife like mine, and being obliged to go farther, he will necessarily fare worse. My wife has done miracles, but I will not assert that any other woman is able to follow her example. Margaret always said that the old place was beautiful, and that I ought to be proud of it. I dare say she's right. She has even more imagination than I. But I have a good answer and a plain one, which is this, that all the beauty of the castle comes from her. She has breathed upon it all, as the children blow upon the cold glass window panes in winter, and as their warm breath crystallizes into landscapes from fairyland, full of exquisite shapes and traceries upon the blank surface, so her spirit has transformed every gray stone of the old towers, every ancient tree and hedge in the gardens, every thought in my once melancholy self. All that was old is young, and all that was sad is glad, and I am the gladdest of all. Whatever heaven may be, there is no earthly paradise without woman, 
nor is there anywhere a place so desolate, so dreary, so unutterably miserable, that a woman cannot make it seem heaven to the man she loves and who loves her. I hear certain cynics laugh and cry that all that has been said before. Do not laugh, my good cynic. You are too small a man to laugh at such a great thing as love. Prayers have been said before now by many, and perhaps you say yours too. I do not think they lose anything by being repeated, nor you by repeating them. You say that the world is bitter, and full of the waters of bitterness. Love, and so live that you may be loved. The world will turn sweet for you, and you shall rest like me by the waters of paradise. From the Play Actress and the Upper Birth by Francis Marion Crawford Copyright 1896 by G. P. Putnam's Sons End of Section 2「Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 1, by Julian Hawthorne, Editor. Section 3. The Shadows on the Wall by Mary Eleanor Wilkins Freeman, 1852-1930. Henry had words with Edward in the study the night before Edward died, said Caroline Glynn. She was elderly, tall, and harshly thin with the hard colorlessness of face. She spoke not with acrimony, but with grave severity. Rebecca Ann Glynn, younger, stouter, and rosy of face, between her crinkling puffs of gray hair, gasped by way of assent. She sat in a white flounce of black silk in the corner of the sofa, and rolled terrified eyes from her sister Carolyn to her sister Mrs. Stephen Brigham, who had been Emma Glynn, the one beauty of the family. She was beautiful still, with a large, splendid, full-blown beauty. She filled a great rocking-chair with her superb bulk of femininity, and swayed gently back and forth, her black silks whispering and her black frills fluttering. Even the shock of death, for her brother Edward lay dead in the house, could not disturb her outward serenity of demeanor. She was grieved over the loss of her brother. He had been the youngest, and she had been fond of him, but never had Emma Brigham lost sight of her own importance amidst the waters of tribulation. She was always awake to the consciousness of her own stability in the midst of vicissitudes and the splendor of her permanent bearing. But even the expression of masterly placidity changed before her sister Caroline's announcement and her sister Rebecca Ann's gasp of terror and distress in response. I think Henry might have controlled his temper when poor Edward was so near his end, said she with an asperity which disturbed slightly the roseate curves of her beautiful mouth. Of course he did not know, said Rebecca Ann in a faint tone strangely out of keeping with her appearance. One involuntarily looked again to be sure that such a feeble pipe came from that full swelling chest. Of course he did not know it, said Caroline quickly. She turned on her sister with a strange sharp look of suspicion. How could he have known it, said she. Then she shrank as if from the other's possible answer. Of course you and I both know he could not, said she conclusively. But her pale face was paler than it had been before. Rebecca gasped again. The married sister, Mrs. Emma Brigham, was now sitting up straight in her chair. She ceased rocking and was eyeing them both intently, with a sudden accentuation of family likeness in her face. Given one common intensity of emotion and similar lines showed forth, and the three sisters of one race were evident. What do you mean? said she impartially to them both. Then she, too, seemed to shrink before the possible answer. She even laughed an evasive sort of laugh. I guess you don't mean anything, said she, but her face wore still the expression of shrinking horror. Nobody means anything, said Caroline firmly. She rose and crossed the room toward the door with grim decisiveness. Where are you going? asked Mrs. Brigham. I have something to see to, replied Caroline and the others at once knew by her tone that she had some solemn and sad duty to perform in the chamber of death. 
oh said mrs brigham after the door had closed behind caroline she turned to rebecca did henry have many words with him she asked they were talking very loud replied rebecca evasively yet with an answering gleam of ready response to the other's curiosity in the quick lift of her soft blue eyes mrs brigham looked at her she had not resumed rocking she still sat up straight with a slight knitting of intensity on her fair forehead between the pretty rippling curves of her auburn hair did you hear anything she asked in a low voice with a glance toward the door i was just across the hall in the south parlor and that door was open to this door ajar replied rebecca with a slight flush then you must have i couldn't help it everything most of it what was it the old story i suppose henry was mad as he always was because edward was living on here for nothing when he had wasted all the money father left him rebecca nodded with a fearful glance at the door when emma spoke again her voice was still more hushed i know how he felt said she he had always been so prudent himself and worked hard at his profession and there edward had never done anything but spend and it must have looked to him as if edward was living at his expense but he wasn't no he wasn't it was the way father left the property that all the children should have a home here and he left money enough to buy the food and all if we had all come home yes and edward had a right here according to the terms of father's will and henry ought to have remembered it yes he ought did he say hard things pretty hard from what i heard what i heard him tell edward that he had no business here at all and he thought he had better go away what did edward say that he would stay here as long as he lived and afterwards too if he was a mind to and he would like to see henry get him out and then what then he laughed what did henry say i didn't hear him say anything but but what i saw him when he came out of this room he looked mad you've seen him when he looks so emma nodded the expression of horror on her face had deepened do you remember that time he killed the cat because she had scratched him yes don't then caroline re-entered the room she went up to the stove in which a wood fire was burning it was a cold gloomy day of fall and she warmed her hands which were reddened from recent washing in cold water mrs brigham looked at her and hesitated she glanced at the door which was still ajar as it did not easily shut being still swollen with the damp weather of the summer she rose and pushed it together with a sharp thud which jarred the house rebecca started painfully with a half exclamation caroline looked at her disapprovingly it is time you controlled your nerves rebecca said she i can't help it replied rebecca with almost a wail i am nervous there is enough to make me so the lord knows what do you mean by that asked caroline with her old air of sharp suspicion and something between challenge and dread of its being met rebecca shrank nothing said she then i wouldn't keep speaking in such a fashion emma returning from the closed door said imperiously that it ought to be fixed it shut so hard it will shrink enough after we've had a fire a few days replied caroline if anything is done to it it will be too small there will be a crack at the sill i think henry ought to be ashamed of himself for talking as he did to edward said mrs brigham abruptly but in an almost inaudible voice hush said caroline with a glance of actual fear at the closed door nobody can hear with the door shut he must have heard it shut and well i can say what i want to before he comes down and i'm not afraid of him i don't know who is afraid of him what reason is there for anybody to be afraid of henry demanded caroline mrs brigham trembled before her sister's look rebecca gasped again 
There isn't any reason, of course. Why should there be? I wouldn't speak so, then. Somebody might overhear you and think it was queer. Miranda Joy is in the south parlor sewing, you know. I thought she went upstairs to stitch on the machine. She did, but she has come down again. Well, she can't hear. I say again, I think Henry ought to be ashamed of himself. I shouldn't think he'd ever get over it, having words with poor Edward the very night before he died. Edward was in a sight better disposition than Henry, with all his faults. I always thought a great deal of poor Edward myself. Mrs. Brigham passed a large fluff of handkerchief across her eyes. Rebecca sobbed outright. Rebecca, said Caroline admonishingly, keeping her mouth stiff and swallowing determinately. I never heard him speak a cross word unless he spoke cross to Henry that last night. I don't know, but he did from what Rebecca overheard, said Emma. Not so much cross as sort of soft and sweet and aggravating, sniffled Rebecca. He never raised his voice, said Caroline, but he had his way. He had a right to in this case. Yes, he did. He had as much right here as Henry, sobbed Rebecca. And now he's gone, and he will never be in this home that poor father left him and the rest of us again. What do you really think ailed Edward? asked Emma in hardly more than a whisper. She did not look at her sister. Caroline sat down in a nearby armchair and clutched the arms convulsively until her thin knuckles whitened. I told you, said she. Rebecca held her handkerchief over her mouth and looked at them above it with terrified, streaming eyes. I know you said that he had terrible pains in his stomach and had spasms, but what do you think made him have them? Henry called it gastric trouble. Henry called it gastric trouble. You know, Edward has always had dyspepsia. Mrs. Brigham hesitated a moment. Was there any talk of an examination, said she? Then Caroline turned on her fiercely. No, said she in a terrible voice. No. The three sisters' souls seemed to meet on one common ground of terrified understanding through their eyes. The old-fashioned latch of the door was heard to rattle, and a push from without made the door shake ineffectually. It's Henry, Rebecca sighed, rather than whispered. Mrs. Brigham settled herself after a noiseless rush across the floor into her rocking chair again, and was swaying back and forth with her head comfortably leaning back, when the door at last yielded and Henry Glynn entered. He cast a covertly sharp, comprehensive glance at Mrs. Brigham with her elaborate calm, at Rebecca quietly huddled in the corner of the sofa with her handkerchief to her face and only one small reddened ear as attentive as a dog's uncovered and revealing her alertness for his presence, at Caroline sitting with her strained composure in her armchair by the stove. She met his eyes quite firmly with a look of inscrutable fear and defiance of the fear and of him. Henry Glynn looked more like this sister than the others. Both had the same hard delicacy of form and feature. Both were tall and almost emaciated. Both had a sparse growth of grey blonde hair far back from high intellectual foreheads. Both had an almost noble aquilinity of feature. They confronted each other with the pitiless immovability of two statues in whose marble lineaments emotions were fixed for all eternity. Then Henry Glynn smiled, and the smile transformed his face. He looked suddenly years younger, and an almost boyish recklessness and irresolution appeared in his face. He flung himself into a chair with a gesture which was bewildering from its incongruity with his general appearance. He leaned his head back, flung one leg over the other, and looked laughingly at Mrs. Brigham. I declare, Emma, you grow younger every year, he said. She flushed a little, and her placid mouth widened at the corners. She was susceptible to praise. Our thoughts today ought to belong to the one of us who will never grow older, said Caroline in a hard voice. Henry looked at her, still smiling. Of course, we none of us forget that, said he in a deep, gentle voice. But we have to speak to the living, Caroline, and I have not seen Emma for a long time. The living are as dear as the dead. 
Not to me, said Caroline. She rose and went abruptly out of the room again. Rebecca also rose and hurried after her, sobbing loudly. Henry looked slowly after them. Caroline is completely unstrung, said he. Mrs. Brigham rocked. A confidence in him inspired by his manner was stealing over her. Out of that confidence she spoke quite easily and naturally. His death was very sudden, said she. Henry's eyelids quivered slightly, but his gaze was unswerving. Yes, said he, it was very sudden. He was sick only a few hours. What did you call it? Gastric. You did not think of an examination? There was no need. I am perfectly certain as to the cause of his death. Suddenly Mrs. Brigham felt a creep as of some live horror over her very soul. Her flesh prickled with cold before an inflection of his voice. She rose, tottering on weak knees. "'Where are you going?' asked Henry in a strange, breathless voice. Mrs. Brigham said something incoherent about some sewing which she had to do, some black for the funeral, and was out of the room. She went up to the front chamber which she occupied. Caroline was there. She went close to her and took her hands, and the two sisters looked at each other. "'Don't speak, don't. I won't have it,' said Caroline, finally, in an awful whisper. "'I won't,' replied Emma. That afternoon the three sisters were in the study, the large front room on the ground floor across the hall from the south parlour, when the dusk deepened. Mrs. Brigham was hemming some black material. She sat close to the west window for the waning light. At last she laid her work on her lap. "'It's no use. I cannot see to sew another stitch until we have a light,' said she. Caroline, who was writing some letters at the table, turned to Rebecca in her usual place on the sofa. "'Rebecca, you had better get a lamb,' she said. Rebecca started up. Even in the dusk her face showed her agitation. "'It doesn't seem to me that we need a lamb quite yet,' she said in a piteous, pleading voice like a child's. Yes, we do, returned Mrs. Brigham peremptorily. We must have a light. I must finish this tonight, or I can't go to the funeral, and I can't see to sew another stitch. Caroline can see to write letters, and she is farther from the window than you are, said Rebecca. Are you trying to save kerosene, or are you lazy, Rebecca Glynn, cried Mrs. Brigham. I can go and get the light myself, but I have this work all in my lap. Caroline's pen stopped scratching. Rebecca, we must have the light, said she. Have we better have it in here, asked Rebecca weakly. Of course, why not, cried Caroline sternly. I am sure I don't want to take my sewing into the other room, when it is all cleaned up for tomorrow, said Mrs. Brigham. Why, I never heard such a to-do about lighting a lamp. Rebecca rose and left the room. Presently she entered with a lamp, a large one with a white porcelain shade. She set it on a table, an old-fashioned card table, which was placed against the opposite wall from the window. That wall was clear of bookcases and books, which were only on three sides of the room. That opposite wall was taken up with three doors, the one small space being occupied by the table. Above the table, on the old-fashioned paper of a
Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 1, by Julian Hawthorne, Editor. Section 4, The Shadow on the Wall, Part 2, by Mary Eleanor Wilkins Freeman. Suddenly, Mrs. Brigham, as she sewed, glanced at the opposite wall. The glance became a steady stare. She looked intently, her work suspended in her hands. Then she looked away again and took a few more stitches. Then she looked again and again turned to her task. At last she laid her work in her lap and stared concentratedly. She looked from the wall around the roof, taking note of the various objects. She looked at the wall long and intently. Then she turned to her sisters. What is that? she said. What? asked Carolyn harshly. Her pen scratched loudly across the paper. Rebecca gave one of her convulsive gasps. That strange shadow on the wall, replied Mrs. Bickham. Rebecca sat with her face hidden. Carolyn dipped her pen in the inkstand. Why don't you turn around and look? asked Mrs. Bigham in a wondering and somewhat aggrieved way. I am in a hurry to finish this letter. If Mrs. Wilson Ebbett is going to get word in time to come to the funeral, replied Carolyn shortly. Mrs. Brigham rose, her work slipping to the floor, and she began walking around the room, moving various articles of furniture with her eyes on the shadow. Then suddenly she shrieked out, Look at this awful shadow! What is it, Carolyn? Look! Look! Rebecca, look! What is it? All Mrs. Brigham's triumphant placidity was gone. Her handsome face was livid with horror. She stood stiffly, pointing at the shadow. Look! she said, pointing her finger at it. Look! What is it? Then Rebecca burst out in a wild wail after a shuddering glance at the wall. Oh, Carolyn, there it is again! There it is again! Carolyn Glenn, you look! said Mrs. Brigham. Look! What is that dreadful shadow? Carolyn rose, turned, and stood confronting the wall. How should I know? she said. It has been there every night since he died, cried Rebecca. Every night? Yes, he died Thursday. This is Saturday. That makes three nights, said Carolyn rigidly. She stood as if holding herself calm with a vice of con concentrated will. It, it looks like, like, stammered Mrs. Brigham in a tone of intense horror. I know what it looks like well enough, said Carolyn. I've got eyes in my head. It looks like Edward, burst out Rebecca in a sort of frenzy of fear only. Yes, it does, assented Mrs. Brigham, whose horror-stricken tone matched her sister's. Only, oh, it's awful. What is it, Carolyn? I ask you again, how should I know, replied Carolyn. I see it there like you. How should I know any more than you? It must be something in the room, said Mrs. Brigham, staring wildly around. We've moved everything in the room the first night it came, said Rebecca. It's not anything in the room. Carolyn turned upon her with a sort of fury. Of course it's something in the room, she said. How you act. What do you mean by talking so? Of course it is something in the room. Of course it is, agreed Mrs. Brigham, looking at Carolyn suspiciously. Of course it must be. It is only a coincidence. It just happens so. Perhaps it is that fold of the window curtain that makes it. It must be something in the room. It's not anything in the room, repeated Be Rebecca with obstinate horror. The door suddenly opened, and Henry Glenn entered. He began to speak. Then his eyes followed the direction of the others. He stood stock still, staring at the shadow on the wall. It was life-size and stretched across the white parallelogram of a door, half across the wall space on which the picture hung. What is that? he demanded in a strange voice. It must be due to something in the room, Mrs. Brigham said faintly. It's not due to anything in the room, said Rebecca again with a shrill intensity of terror. How you act, Rebecca Glenn, said Carolyn. Henry Glenn stood and stared a moment longer. His face showed a gamut of emotions, horror, conviction, then furious incredulity. Suddenly he began hastening hither and thither about the room. He moved the furniture with fierce jerks, turning ever to see the effect upon the shadow on the wall. 
not a line of its terrible outlines wavered. "'It must be something in the room,' he declared in a voice which seemed to snap like a lash. His face changed. The inmost secrecy of his nature seemed evident until one almost lost sight of his lineaments. Rebecca stood close to her sofa, regarding him with woeful, fascinated eyes. Mrs. Brigham clutched Carolyn's hand. They both stood in a corner out of the way. For a few moments he raged about the room like a caged, wild animal. He moved every piece of furniture. When the moving of a piece did not affect the shadow, he flung it to the floor, his sisters watching. Then suddenly he desisted. He laughed and began straightening the furniture which he had flung down. "'What an absurdity,' he said easily. "'Such a to-do about a shadow.' "'That's so,' assented Mrs. Brigham in a scared voice, which she tried to make natural. As she spoke, she lifted a chair near her. "'I think you have broken the chair that Edward was so fond of,' said Carolyn. Terror and wrath were struggling for expression on her face. Her mouth was set, her eyes shrinking. Henry lifted the chair with a show of anxiety. "'Just as good as ever,' he said pleasantly. He laughed again, looking at his sisters. "'Did I scare you?' he said. "'I should think you might be used to me by this time. You know my way of wanting to leap to the bottom of a mystery, and that shadow does look queer-like, and I thought if there was any way of accounting for it, I would like to do it without any delay.' "'You don't seem to have succeeded,' remarked Carolyn dryly, with a slight glance at the wall. Henry's eyes followed hers, and he quivered perceptibly. "'Oh, there is no accounting for shadows,' he said, and he laughed again. "'A man is a fool to try to account for shadows.' Then the supper bell rang, and they all left the room, but Henry kept his back to the wall, as did, indeed, the others. Mrs. Brigham pressed close to Carolyn as she crossed the hall. "'It looks like a demon,' she breathed in her ear. Henry led the way with an alert motion like a boy. Rebecca brought up the rear. She could scarcely walk. Her knees trembled so. "'I can't sit in that room again this evening,' she whispered to Carolyn after supper. "'Very well, we'll sit in the south room,' replied Carolyn. "'I think we will sit in the south parlor,' she said aloud. "'It isn't as damp as the study, and I have a cold.' So they all sat in the south room with their sewing. Henry read the newspaper, his chair drawn close to the lamp on the table. About nine o'clock he rose abruptly and crossed the hall to the study. The three sisters looked at one another. Mrs. Brigham rose, folded her rustling skirts compactly around her, and began tiptoeing toward the door. "'What are you going to do?' inquired Rebecca agitatedly. "'I am going to see what he is about,' replied Mrs. Brigham cautiously. She pointed, as she spoke, to the study door across the hall. It was ajar. Henry had striven to pull it together behind him, but it had somehow swollen beyond the limit with curious speed. It was still ajar, and a streak of light showed from top to bottom. The hall lamp was not lit. "'You had better stay where you are,' said Carolyn, with guarded sharpness. "'I'm going to see,' repeated Mrs. Brigham firmly. Then she folded her skirt so tightly that her bulk, with its swelling curves, was revealed in a black silk sheath. She went with a slow toddle across the hall to the study door. She stood there, her eye at the crack. In the south room, Rebecca stopped sewing and sat watching with dilated eyes. Carolyn sewed steadily. What Mrs. Brigham, standing at the crack in the study door, saw was this. Henry Glenn, evidently reasoning that the source of the strange shadow must be between the table on which the lamp stood and the wall, was making systematic passes and thrusts all over and through the intervening space with an old sword which had belonged to his father. Not an inch was left unpierced. He seemed to have divided the space into mathematical sections. He brandished the sword with a sort of cold fury and calculation. The blade gave out flashes of light. The shadow remained unmoved. Mrs. Brigham, watching, felt herself cold with horror. 
Finally Henry ceased and stood with the sword in hand and raised as if to strike, surveying the shadow on the wall threateningly. Mrs. Brigham toddled back across the hall and shut the south room door behind her before she related what she had seen. "'He looks like a demon,' she said again. "'Have you got any of that old wine in the house, Carolyn? I don't feel as if I could stand much more.' Indeed, she looked overcome. Her handsome, placid face was worn and strained and pale. "'Yes, there's plenty,' said Carolyn. "'You can have some when you go to bed.' "'I think we had all better take some,' said Mrs. Brigham. "'Oh, my God, Carolyn, what?' "'Don't ask and don't speak,' said Carolyn. "'No, I, I'm not going to,' replied Mrs. Brigham, but—' Rebecca moaned aloud. "'What are you doing that for?' asked Carolyn harshly. "'Poor Edward,' returned Rebecca. "'That is all you have to groan for, said Carolyn. There is nothing else.' "'I am going to bed,' said Mrs. Brigham. "'I shan't be able to be at the funeral if I don't.' Soon the three sisters went to their chambers, and the south parlor was deserted. Carolyn called to Henry in the study to put out the light before he came upstairs. They had been gone about an hour when he came into the room bringing the lamp which had stood in the study. He set it down on the table and waited a few minutes, pacing up and down. His face was terrible. His fair complexion showed livid. His blue eyes seemed dark blanks of awful reflections. Then he took the lamp up and returned to the library. He set the lamp on the center table, and the shadow sprang out on the wall. Again he studied the furniture and moved it about, but deliberately, with none of his former frenzy. Nothing affected the shadow. Then he returned to the south room with the lamp and again waited. Again he returned to the study and placed the lamp on the table, and the shadow sprang out from the wall. It was midnight before he went upstairs. Mrs. Brigham and the other sisters, who could not sleep, heard him. The next day was the funeral. That evening the family sat in the south room. Some relatives were with them. Nobody entered the study until Henry carried a lamp in there after the others had retired for the night. He saw again the shadow on the wall leap to an awful life before the light. The next morning at breakfast, Henry Glenn announced that he had to go to the city for three days. The sisters looked at him with surprise. He very seldom left home, and just now his practice had been neglected on account of Edward's death. He was a physician. "'How can you leave your patients now?' asked Mrs. Brigham wonderingly. I don't know how to, but there is no other way, replied Henry easily. I have had a telegram from Dr. Mitford. Consultation, inquired Mrs. Brigham. I have business, replied Henry. Dr. Mitford was an old classmate of his, who lived in a neighboring city and who occasionally called upon him in the case of a consultation. After he had gone, Mrs. Brigham said to Carolyn that, after all, Henry had not said that he was going to consult with Dr. Midford, and she thought it very strange. "'Everything is very strange,' said Rebecca with a shudder. "'What do you mean?' inquired Carolyn sharply. "'Nothing,' replied Rebecca. Nobody entered the library that day, nor the next, nor the next. The third day Henry was expected home, but he did not arrive, and the last train from the city had come. I call it pretty queer work, said Mrs. Brigham. The idea of a doctor leaving his patients for three days, anyhow, at such a time as this, and I know he has some very sick ones. He said so. And the idea of a consultation lasting three days? There is no sense in it, and now he has not come? I don't understand it for my part. I don't either, said Rebecca. They were all in the south parlor, there was no light in the study opposite, and the door was ajar. Presently Mrs. Brigham rose. She could not have told why. Something seemed to impel her, some will outside her own. She went out of the room, again wrapping her rustling skirts around that she might pass noiselessly, and began pushing at the swollen door of the study. She has not got any lamp, said Rebecca in a shaking voice. Carolyn, who was writing letters, rose again, took a lamp, there were two in the room, and followed her sister. 
Rebecca had risen, but she stood trembling, not venturing to follow. The doorbell rang, but the others did not hear it. It was on the south door, on the other side of the house from the study. Rebecca, after hesitating until the bell rang the second time, went to the door. She remembered that the servant was out. Carolyn and her sister Emma entered the study. Carolyn set the lamp on the table. They looked at the wall. Oh, my God, gasped Mrs. Brigham. There are, there are two shadows. The sisters stood clutching each other, staring at the awful things on the wall. Then Rebecca came in, staggering with a telegram in her hand. Here is a telegram. Henry is dead. End of section four. Section 5 of Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 1, The Corpus Delecti, Part 1, by Melville Davison Post, 1869-1930. through 1930. Melville Davison Post, Introduction to the Corpus Delecti The high ground of the field of crime has not been explored. It has not even been entered. The bookstalls have been filled to weariness with tales based upon plans whereby the detective, or ferreting power of the state, might be baffled. But prodigious marvel! No writer has attempted to construct tales based upon plans whereby the punishing power of the state might be baffled. The distinction, if one pauses for a moment to consider it, is striking. It is possible, even easy, deliberately to plan crimes so that the criminal agent and the criminal agency cannot be detected. Is it possible to plan and execute wrongs in such a manner that they will have all the effect and all the resulting profit of desperate crimes and yet not be crimes before the law? We are prone to forget that the law is no perfect structure that it is simply the result of human labor and human genius, and that whatever laws human ingenuity can create for the protection of men, those same laws human ingenuity can evade. The spirit of evil is no dwarf. He has developed equally with the spirit of good. All wrongs are not crimes. Indeed, only those wrongs are crimes in which certain technical elements are present. The law provides a Procrustean standard for all crimes. Thus, a wrong to become criminal must fit exactly into the measure laid down by the law, else it is no crime. If it varies never so little from the legal measure, the law must, and will, refuse to regard it as criminal, no matter how injurious a wrong it may be. There is no measure of morality, or equity, or common right that can be applied to the individual case. The gauge of the law is iron-bound. The wrong measured by this gauge is either a crime or it is not. There is no middle ground. Hence is it that if one knows well the technicalities of the law, one may commit horrible wrongs that will yield all the gain and all the resulting effect of the highest crimes, and yet the wrongs perpetrated will constitute no one of the crimes described by the law. Thus the highest crimes, even murder, may be committed in such a manner that although the criminal is known and the law holds him in custody, yet it cannot punish him. So it happens that in this year of our Lord of the nineteenth century, the skillful attorney marvels at the stupidity of the rogue who, committing crimes by the ordinary methods, subjects himself to unnecessary peril, when the result which he seeks can easily be attained by other methods, equally expeditious and without danger of liability in any criminal tribunal. This is the field into which the author has ventured, and he believes it to be new and full of interest. It may be objected that the writer has prepared here a textbook for the shrewd knave. To this it is answered that if he instructs the enemies, he also warns the friends of law and order, and that evil has never yet been stronger because the sun shone on it. The Corpus Delecti, Part 1 That man Mason, said Samuel Wilcock, is the mysterious member of this club. 
He is more than that. He is the mysterious man of New York. I was much surprised to see him, answered his companion, Marshal St. Clair, of the great law firm of Seward, St. Clair, and DeMuth. I had lost track of him since he went to Paris as counsel for the American stockholders of the Canal Company. When did he come back to the States? He turned up suddenly in his ancient haunts about four months ago, said Walcott, as grand, gloomy, and peculiar as Napoleon ever was in his palmiest days. The younger members of the club call him Zanona Redivivus. He wanders through the house, usually at night, apparently without noticing anything or anybody. His mind seems to be deeply and busily at work, leaving his bodily self to wander as it may happen. Naturally, strange stories are told of him. Indeed, his individuality and his habit of doing some unexpected thing, and doing it in such a marvelously original manner that men who are experts at it look on in wonder, cannot fail to make him an object of interest. He has never been known to play at any game, whatever, and yet one night he sat down to the chess table with old Admiral Dubray. You know the Admiral is the great champion since he beat the French and English officers in the tournament last winter. Well, you also know that the conventional openings at chess are scientifically and accurately determined. To the utter disgust of Dubray, Mason opened the game with an unheard of attack from the extremes of the board. The old admiral stopped and, in a kindly, patronizing way, pointed out the weak and absurd folly of his move and asked him to begin again with some one of the safe openings. Mason smiled and answered that if one had a head that he could trust, he should use it. If not, then it was the part of wisdom to follow blindly the dead forms of some man who had a head. Dupre was naturally angry, and set himself to demolish Mason as quickly as possible. The game was rapid for a few moments. Mason lost piece after piece. His opening was broken and destroyed, and its utter folly apparent to the lookers-on. The admiral smiled, and the game seemed all one-sided when, suddenly, to his utter horror, Dubray found that his king was in a trap. The foolish opening had been only a piece of shrewd strategy. The old admiral fought and cursed and sacrificed his pieces, but it was of no use. He was gone. Mason checkmated him in two moves and arose wearily. "'Where in heaven's name, man,' said the old admiral, thunderstruck, "'did you learn that masterpiece?' "'Just here,' replied Mason. "'To play chess, one should know his opponent. "'How could the dead masters lay down rules by which you could be beaten, sir? "'They had never seen you.' "'And thereupon he turned and left the room. "'Of course, St. Clair, such a strange man would soon become "'an object of all kinds of mysterious rumors. "'Some are true, and some are not. "'At any rate, I know that Mason is an unusual man with a gigantic intellect. "'Of late he seems to have taken a strange fancy to me. "'In fact, I seem to be the only member of the club that he will talk with, "'and I confess that he startles and fascinates me. "'He is an original genius, St. Clair, of an unusual order. "'I recall vividly,' said the younger man, "'that before Mason went to Paris he was considered one of the greatest lawyers of the city, "'and he was feared and hated by the bar at large. "'He came here, I believe, from Virginia, and began with the high-grade criminal practice. "'He soon became famous for his powerful and ingenious defenses. "'He found holes in the law through which his clients escaped, "'holes that by the profession at large were not suspected to exist, "'and that frequently astonished the judges. "'His ability caught the attention of the great corporations. "'They tested him and found in him learning and unlimited resources. "'He pointed out methods by which they could evade obnoxious statutes, "'by which they could comply with the apparent letter of the law, "'and yet violate its spirit, "'and advised them well in that most important of all things "'just how far they could bend the law, without breaking it. At the time he left for Paris, he had a vast clientage and was in the midst of a brilliant career. The day he took passage from New York, the bar lost sight of him. No matter how great a man may be, the wave soon closes over him in a city like this. In a few years, Mason was forgotten. Now only the older practitioners would recall him, and they would do so with hatred and bitterness. He was a tireless, savage, uncompromising fighter, always a recluse. Well, said Walcott, he reminds me of a great world-weary cynic, transplanted from some ancient, mysterious empire. When I come into the man's presence, I feel instinctively in the grip of his intellect. 
I tell you, St. Clair, Randolph Mason is the mysterious man of New York. At this moment, a messenger boy came into the room and handed Mr. Walcott a telegram. St. Clair, said that gentleman, rising, the directors of the elevated are in session, and we must hurry. The two men put on their coats and left the house. Samuel Walcott was not a club man after the manner of the smart set, and yet he was, in fact, a club man. He was a bachelor in the latter thirties, and resided in a great silent house on the avenue. On the street he was a man of substance, shrewd and progressive, backed by great wealth. He had various corporate interests in the larger syndicates, but the basis and foundation of his fortune was real estate. His houses on the avenue were the best possible property, and his elevator row in the importer's quarter was indeed a literal gold mine. It was known that many years before his grandfather had died and left him the property, which at that time was of no great value. Young Walcott had gone out into the gold fields and had been lost sight of and forgotten. Ten years afterwards he had turned up suddenly in New York and taken possession of his property, then vastly increased in value. His speculations were almost phenomenally successful, and, backed by the now enormous value of his real property, he was soon on a level with the merchant princes. His judgment was considered sound, and he had the full confidence of his business associates for safety and caution. Fortune heaped up riches around him with a lavish hand. He was unmarried, and the halo of his wealth caught the keen eye of the matron with marriageable daughters. He was invited out, caught by the whirl of society, and tossed into its maelstrom. In a measure he reciprocated. He kept horses and a yacht, his dinners at Delmonico's and the club were above reproach, but withal he was a silent man with a shadow deep in his eyes and seemed to court the society of his fellows, not because he loved them, but because he either hated or feared solitude. For years the strategy of the matchmaker had gone gracefully afield, but fate is relentless. If she shields the victim from the traps of men, it is not because she wishes him to escape, but because she is pleased to reserve him for her own trap. So it happened that when Virginia St. Clair assisted Mrs. Miriam Stuyvesant at her midwinter reception, this same Samuel Walcott fell deeply and hopelessly and utterly in love, and it was so apparent to the beaten generals present that Mrs. Miriam Stuyvesant applauded herself, so to speak, with encore after encore. It was good to see this courteous, silent man literally at the feet of the young debutante. He was there of right. Even the mothers of marriageable daughters admitted that. The young girl was brown-haired, brown-eyed, and tall enough, said the experts, and of the blue blood royal, with all the grace, courtesy, and inbred genius of such princely heritage. Perhaps it was objected by the censors of the smart set that Miss St. Clair's frankness and honesty were a trifle old-fashioned, and that she was a shadowy bit of a Puritan and perhaps it was of these same qualities that Samuel Walcott received his hurt. At any rate, the hurt was there and deep, and the new actor stepped up into the old-time-worn semi-tragic drama and began his role with a tireless, utter sincerity that was deadly dangerous if he lost. Perhaps a week after the conversation between St. Clair and Walcott, Randolph Mason stood in the private waiting-room of the club, with his hands behind his back. He was a man apparently in the middle forties, tall and reasonably broad across the shoulders, muscular without being either stout or lean. His hair was thin and of a brown color with erratic streaks of gray. His forehead was broad and high and of a faint reddish color. His eyes were restless inky black and not over large. The nose was big and muscular and bowed. The eyebrows were black and heavy, almost bushy. There were heavy furrows running from the nose downward and outward to the corners of the mouth. The mouth was straight, and the jaw was heavy and square. Looking at the face of Randolph Mason from above, the expression in repose was crafty and cynical. Viewed from below upward, it was savage and vindictive, almost brutal. While from the front, if looked squarely in the face, the stranger was fascinated by the animation of the man and at once concluded that his expression was fearless and sneering. He was evidently of southern extraction and a man of unusual power. 
A fire smoldered on the hearth. It was a crisp evening in the early fall, and with that far-off touch of melancholy which ever heralds the coming winter, even in the midst of a city. The man's face looked tired and ugly. His long white hands were clasped tight together. His entire figure and face wore every mark of weakness and physical exhaustion, but his eyes contradicted. They were red and restless. In the private dining-room, the dinner-party was in the best of spirits. Samuel Walcott was happy. Across the table from him was Miss Virginia St. Clair, radiant, a tinge of color in her cheeks. On either side, Miss Miriam Stuvesant and Marshal St. Clair were brilliant and light-hearted. Walcott looked at the young girl, and the measure of his worship was full. He wondered for the thousandth time how she could possibly love him, and by what earthly miracle she had come to accept him, and how it would be to always have her across the table from him, his own table, in his own house. They were about to rise from the table when one of the waiters entered the room and handed Walcott an envelope. He thrust it quickly into his pocket. In the confusion of rising, the others did not notice him, but his face was ash-white, and his hands trembled violently as he placed the wraps around the bewitching shoulders of Miss St. Clair. Marshal, he said, and despite the powerful effort his voice was hollow, you will see the ladies safely cared for. I am called to attend a grave matter. All right, Walcott, answered the young man with cheery good nature. You are too serious, old man. Trot along. The poor dear, murmured Miss Duvesant, after Walcott had helped them to the carriage and turned to go up the steps of the club. The poor dear is hard hit, and men are such funny creatures when they are hard hit. Samuel Walcott, as his fate would, went direct to the private writing-room and opened the door. The lights were not turned on, and in the dark he did not see Mason motionless by the mantel-shelf. He went quickly across the room to the writing-table turned on one of the lights and taking the envelope from his pocket tore it open then he bent down by the light to read the contents as his eyes ran over the paper his jaw fell the skin drew away from his cheek bones and his face seemed literally to sink in his knees gave way under him and he would have gone down in a heap had it not been for mason's long arms that closed around him and held him up the human economy is ever mysterious the moment the new danger threatened the latent power of the man as an animal hidden away in the centres of intelligence asserted itself his hand clutched the paper and with a half slide he turned in mason's arms for a moment he stared up at the ugly man whose thin arms felt like wire ropes you are under the deadfall eh said mason the cunning of my enemy is sublime your enemy gasped walcott when did you come into it how in god's name did you know it how your enemy mason looked down at the wide bulging eyes of the man who should know better than i he said haven't i broken through all the traps and plots that she could set she she trap you the man's voice was full of horror the old schemer muttered mason the cowardly old schemer to strike in the back but we can beat her she did not count on my helping you i who know her so well mason's face was red and his eyes burned in the midst of it all he had dropped his hands and went over to the fire samuel walcott arose panting and stood looking at mason with his hands behind him on the table the naturally strong nature and the rigid school in which the man had been trained presently began to tell his composure in part returned and he thought rapidly what did this strange man know was he simply making shrewd guesses or had he some mysterious knowledge of this matter walcott could not know that mason meant only fate that he believed her to be his great enemy walcott had never before doubted his own ability to meet any emergency this mighty jerk had carried him off his feet he was unstrung and panic-stricken at any rate this man had promised help he would take it he put the paper and envelope carefully into his pocket smoothed out his rumpled coat and going over to mason touched him on the shoulder come he said if you are going to help me we must go the man turned and followed him without a word in the hall mason put on his hat and overcoat and the two went out into the street walcott hailed a cab and the two were driven to his house on the avenue walcott took out his latch-key opened the door and led the way into the library he turned on the light and motioned Mason to seat himself at the table. Then he went into another room, and presently returned with a bundle of papers and a decanter of brandy. He poured out a glass of the liquor and offered it to Mason. 
The man shook his head. Walcott poured the contents of the glass down his own throat. Then he set the decanter down and drew up a chair on the side of the table opposite Mason. Sir, said Walcott in a voice deliberate indeed, but as hollow as a sepulchre, I am done for. God has finally gathered up the ends of the net, and it is knotted tight. Am I not here to help you? said Mason, turning savagely. I can beat fate. Give me the details of her trap. He bent forward and rested his arms on the table. His streaked gray hair was rumpled on end, and his face was ugly. For a moment Walcott did not answer. He moved a little into the shadow, then he spread the bundle of old yellow papers out before him. To begin with, he said, I am living a lie, a gilded cry made sham, every bit of me. There is not an honest piece anywhere. It is all lie. I am a liar and a thief before men. The property which I possess is not mine, but stolen from a dead man. The very name which I bear is not my own, but is the bastard child of a crime. I am more than all that. I am a murderer, a murderer before the law, a murderer before God, and worse than a murderer before the pure woman whom I love more than anything that God could make. He paused for a moment and wiped the perspiration from his face. Sir, said Mason, this is all drivel, infantile drivel. What you are is of no importance. How to get out is the problem. How to get out. Samuel Walcott leaned forward and poured out a glass of brandy and swallowed it. Well, he said, speaking slowly, my right name is Richard Warren. In the spring of 1879 I came to New York and fell in with the real Samuel Walcott, a young man with a little money and some property which his grandfather had left him. We became friends and concluded to go to the far west together. Accordingly, we scraped together what money we could lay our hands on and landed in the gold-mining regions of California. We were young and inexperienced and our money went rapidly. One April morning we drifted into a little shack camp away up in the Sierra Nevadas called Hell's Elbow. Here we struggled and starved for perhaps a year. Finally, in utter desperation, Walcott married the daughter of a Mexican gambler who ran an eating house and a poker joint. With them we lived from hand to mouth in a wild God-forsaken way for several years. After a time the woman began to take a strange fancy to me. Walcott finally noticed it and grew jealous. One night, in a drunken brawl, we quarreled, and I killed him. It was late at night, and beside the woman there were four of us in the poker room. The Mexican gambler, a half-breed devil called Cherubin Pete, Walcott, and myself. When Walcott fell, the half-breed whipped out his weapon and fired at me across the table. But the woman, Nina San Croix, struck him his arm, and instead of killing me as he intended, the bullet mortally wounded her father, the Mexican gambler. I shot the half-breed through the forehead and turned round, expecting the woman to attack me. On the contrary, she pointed to the window and bade me wait for her on the cross-trail below. It was fully three hours later before the woman joined me at the place indicated. She had a bag of gold dust, a few jewels that belonged to her father, and a package of papers. I asked her why she had stayed behind so long, and she replied that the men were not killed outright, and that she had brought a priest to them, and waited until they had died. This was the truth, but not all the truth. Moved by superstition or foresight, the woman had induced the priest to take down the sworn statements of the two dying men, seal it, and give it to her. This paper she brought with her, all this I learned afterwards. At the time, I knew nothing of this damning evidence. We struck out for the Pacific coast. The country was lawless. The privations we endured were almost past belief. At times the woman exhibited cunning and ability that were almost genius, and through it all, often in the very fingers of death, her devotion to me never wavered. It was dog-like, and seemed to be her only object on earth. When we reached San Francisco, the woman put these papers into my hands. Walcott took up the yellow package and pushed it across the table to Mason. 
she proposed that I assume Wolcott's name and that we come boldly to New York and claim the property. I examined the papers, found a copy of the will by which Walcott inherited the property, a bundle of correspondence, and sufficient documentary evidence to establish his identity beyond the shadow of a doubt. Desperate gambler as I now was, I quailed before the daring plan of Nina San Croix. I urged that I, Richard Warren, would be known that the attempted fraud would be detected and would result in investigation and perhaps unearth the whole terrible matter. The woman pointed out how much I resemble Wolcott, what vast changes ten years of such life as we had led would naturally be expected to make in men, how utterly impossible it would be to trace back the fraud to Wolcott's murder at Hell's Elbow, in the wild passes of the Sierra Nevadas. She bade me remember that we were both outcasts, both crime-branded, both enemies of man's law and God's, and that we had nothing to lose. We were both sunk to the bottom. Then she laughed, and she said that she had not found me a coward until now, but if I had turned chicken-hearted, that was the end of it, of course. The result was we sold the gold dust and jewels in San Francisco, took on such evidences of civilization as possible, and purchased passage to New York on the best steamer we could find. I was growing to depend on the bold gambler spirit of this woman, Nina San Croix. I felt the need of her strong, profligate nature. She was of a queer breed and a queerer school. Her mother was the daughter of a Spanish engineer and had been stolen by the Mexican, her father. She herself had been raised and educated as best might be in one of the monasteries along the Rio Grande, and had there grown to womanhood before her father, fleeing into the mountains of California, carried her with him. When we landed in New York, I offered to announce her as my wife, but she refused, saying that her presence would excite comment and perhaps attract the attention of Walcott's relatives. We therefore arranged that I should go alone into the city, claim the property, and announce myself as Samuel Walcott, and that she should remain under cover until such time as we would feel the ground safe under us. Every detail of the plan was fatally successful. I established my identity without difficulty and secured the property. It had increased vastly in value, and I, as Samuel Walcott, soon found myself a rich man. I went to Nina San Croix in hiding and gave her a large sum of money, which she purchased a residence in a retired part of the city, far up in the northern suburb. Here she lived secluded and unknown while I remained in the city, living here as a wealthy bachelor. I did not attempt to abandon the woman, but went to her from time to time in disguise and under cover of the greatest secrecy. For a time everything ran smooth, the woman was still devoted to me above everything else, and thought always of my welfare first, and seemed content to wait so long as I thought best. My business expanded, I was sought after and consulted and drawn into the higher life of New York, and more and more felt that the woman was an albatross on my neck. I put her off with one excuse after another. Finally she began to suspect me, and demanded that I should recognize her as my wife. I attempted to point out the difficulties. She met them all by saying that we should both go to Spain. There I could marry her, and we could return to America and drop into my place in society without causing more than a passing comment. I concluded to meet the matter squarely once and for all. I said that I would convert half of the property into money and give it to her, but that I would not marry her. She did not fly into a storming rage as I had expected, but went quietly out of the room and presently returned with two papers, which she read. One was the certificate of her marriage to Walcott, duly authenticated. The other was the dying statement of her father, the Mexican gambler, and of Samuel Walcott, charging me with murder. It was in proper form and certified by the Jesuit priest. Now, she said sweetly when she had finished, which do you prefer? to recognize your wife or to turn all the property over to samuel walcott's widow and hang for his murder i was dumbfounded and horrified i saw the trap that i was in and i consented to do anything she should say if she would only destroy the papers 
This she refused to do. I pleaded with her and implored her to destroy them. Finally, she gave them to me with a great show of returning confidence, and I tore them into bits and threw them into the fire. That was three months ago. We arranged to go to Spain and do as she said. She was to sail this morning, and I was to follow. Of course I never intended to go. I congratulated myself on the fact that all trace of evidence against me was destroyed, and that her grip was now broken. My plan was to induce her to sail, believing that I would follow. When she was gone I would marry Miss St. Clair, and if Nina St. Croix should return, I would defy her, and lock her up as a lunatic. But I was reckoning like an infernal ass, to imagine for a moment that I could thus hoodwink such a woman as Nina St. Croix. Tonight I received this. Walcott took the envelope from his pocket and gave it to Mason. You saw the effect of it. Read it and you will understand why. I felt the death hand when I saw her writing on the envelope. Mason took the paper from the envelope. It was written in Spanish and ran. Greeting to Richard Warren. The great signor does his little Nina injustice to think she would go away to Spain and leave him to the beautiful American. She is not so thoughtless. Before she goes, she shall be oh so very rich, and the dear signor shall be oh so very safe. The Archbishop and the kind church hate murderers. Nina San Croix. Of course, fool, the papers you destroyed were copies. N. San C. To this was penned a line in a delicate aristocratic hand, saying that the Archbishop would willingly listen to Madame San Croix's statement if she would come to see him on Friday morning at eleven. You see, said Walcott desperately, there is no possible way out. I know the woman. When she decides to do a thing, that is the end of it. She has decided to do this. Mason turned around from the table, stretched out his long legs, and thrust his hands deep into his pockets. Walcott sat with his head down, watching Mason hopelessly, almost indifferently, his face blank and sunken. The ticking of the bronze clock on the mantel-shelf was loud, painfully loud. Suddenly, Mason drew his knees in and bent over, put both his bony hands on the table and looked at Walcott. Sir, he said, this matter is in such shape that there is only one thing to do. This growth must be cut out at the roots and cut out quickly. This is the first fact to be determined, and a fool would know it. The second fact is that you must do it yourself. Hired killers are like the grave and the daughters of the horse-leech. They cry always, Give! Give! They are only palliatives, not cures. By using them, you swap perils. You simply take a stay of execution at best. The common criminal would know this. These are the facts of your problem. The master plotters of crime would see here but two difficulties to meet a practical method for accomplishing the body of the crime, a cover for the criminal agent. They would see no farther and attempt to guard no farther. After they had provided a plan for the killing, and a means by which the killer could cover his trail and escape from the theater of the homicide, they would believe all the requirements of the problems met, and would stop. The greatest, the very giants among them, have stopped here and have been in great error. In every crime, especially in the great ones, there exists a third element, preeminently vital. This third element the master plotters have either overlooked or else have not had the genius to construct. They plan with rare cunning to baffle the victim. They plan with vast wisdom, almost genius, to baffle the trailer. But they fail utterly to provide any plan for baffling the punisher. Ergo, their plots are fatally defective and often result in ruin. Hence, the vital necessity for providing the third element, the escape ipso jure. Mason arose, walked around the table, and put his hand firmly on Samuel Walcott's shoulder. This must be done tomorrow night, he continued. You must arrange your business matters tomorrow and announce that you are going on a yacht cruise by order of your physician and may not return for some weeks. 
you must prepare your yacht for a voyage instruct your men to touch at a certain point on staten island and wait until six o'clock day after tomorrow morning if you do not come aboard by that time they are to go to one of the south american ports and remain until further orders by this means your absence for an indefinite period will be explained you will go to nina st croix in the disguise which you have always used and from her to the yacht and by this means step out of your real status and back into it without leaving traces i will come here to-morrow evening and furnish you with everything that you shall need and give you full and exact instructions in every particular these details you must execute with the greatest care as they will be vitally essential to the success of my plan through it all walcott had been silent and motionless now he arose and in his face there must have been some premonition of protest for mason stepped back and put out his hand sir he said with brutal emphasis not a word remember that you are only the hand and the hand does not think then he turned around abruptly and went out of the house end of section five section six of library of the world's best mystery and detective stories volume one the corpus delecti part two by melville davison post eighteen sixty nine through nineteen thirty the place which samuel walcott had selected for the residence of nina st croix was far up in the northern suburb of new york the place was very old the lawn was large and ill-kept the house a square old-fashioned brick was set far back from the street and partly hidden by trees around it all was a rusty iron fence the place had the air of genteel ruin such as one finds in the virginias on a thursday of november about three o'clock in the afternoon a little man driving a dray stopped in the alley at the rear of the house as he opened the back gate an old negro woman came down the steps from the kitchen and demanded to know what he wanted the drayman asked if the lady of the house was in the old negro answered that she was asleep at this hour and could not be seen that is good said the little man now there won't be any row i brought up some cases of wine which she ordered from our house last week and which the boss told me to deliver at once but i forgot it until to-day just let me put it in the cellar now auntie and don't say a word to the lady about it and she won't ever know that it was not brought up on time the drayman stopped fished a silver dollar out of his pocket and gave it to the old negro there now auntie he said my job depends upon the lady not knowing about this wine keep it mum that's all right honey said the old servant beaming like a may morning the cellar door is open carry it all in and put it in the back pot and nobody ain't never gonna know how long it has been in da the old negro went back into the kitchen and the little man began to unload the dray he carried in five wine cases and stowed them away in the back part of the cellar as the old woman had directed then after having satisfied himself that no one was watching he took from the dray two heavy paper sacks presumably filled with flour and a little bundle wrapped in an old newspaper these he carefully hid behind the wine cases in the cellar after a while he closed the door climbed on his dray and drove off down the alley about eight o'clock in the evening of the same day a mexican sailor dodged in the front gate and slipped down to the side of the house he stopped by the window and tapped on it with his finger in a moment a woman opened the door she was tall lithe and splendidly proportioned with a dark spanish face and straight hair the man stepped inside the woman bolted the door and turned round ah she said smiling is it you senor how good of you the man started whom else did you expect he said quickly oh laughed the woman perhaps the archbishop nina said the man in a broken voice that expressed love humility and reproach his face was white under the black sunburn for a moment the woman wavered a shadow flitted over her eyes and then she stepped back no she said not yet the man walked across to the fire sank down in a chair and covered his face with his hands 
The woman stepped up noiselessly behind him and leaned over the chair. The man was either in great agony or else he was a superb actor, for the muscles of his neck twitched violently and his shoulders trembled. Oh, he muttered, as though echoing his thoughts, I can't do it. I can't. The woman caught the words and leaped up as though someone had struck her in the face. She threw back her head. Her nostrils dilated and her eyes flashed. You can't do it? she cried. Then you do love her. You shall do it. Do you hear me? You shall do it. You killed him. You got rid of him. But you shall not get rid of me. I have the evidence. All of it. The archbishop will have it tomorrow. They shall hang you. Do you hear me? They shall hang you! The woman's voice rose. It was loud and shrill. The man turned slowly round without looking up, stretched out his arms toward the woman. She stopped and looked down at him. The fire glittered for a moment and then died out of her eyes. Her bosom heaved and her lips began to tremble. With a cry, she flung herself into his arms, caught him around the neck and pressed his face up close against her cheek. Oh, Dick! Dick! she sobbed. I do love you so. I can't live without you. Not another hour, Dick. I do want you so much, so much, Dick. The man shifted his right arm quickly, slipped a great Mexican knife out of his sleeve, and passed his fingers slowly up the woman's side until he felt the heart beat under his hand. Then he raised the knife, gripped the handle tight, and drove the keen blade into the woman's bosom. The hot blood gushed out over his arm and down on his leg. The body, warm and limp, slipped down in his arms. The man got up, pulled out the knife, and thrust it into a sheath at his belt, unbuttoned the dress, and slipped it off of the body. As he did this, a bundle of papers dropped upon the floor. These he glanced at hastily and put into his pocket. Then he took the dead woman up in his arms, went out into the hall, and started to go up the stairway. The body was relaxed and heavy, and for that reason difficult to carry. He doubled it up into an awful heap with the knees against the chin, and walked slowly and heavily up the stairs and out into the bathroom. There he laid the corpse down on the tiled floor. Then he opened the window, closed the shutters, and lighted the gas. The bathroom was small and contained an ordinary steel tub, porcelain lined, standing near the window and raised about six inches above the floor. The sailor went over to the tub, pried up the metal rim of the outlet with his knife, removed it, and fitted into its place a porcelain disc, which he took from his pocket. To this disc was attached a long platinum wire, the end of which he fastened on the outside of the tub. After he had done this, he went back to the body, stripped off its clothing, put it down in the tub, and began to dismember it with a great Mexican knife. The blade was strong and sharp as a razor. The man worked rapidly and with the greatest care. When he had finally cut the body into as small pieces as possible, he replaced the knife in its sheath, washed his hands, and went out of the bathroom and downstairs to the lower hall. The sailor seemed perfectly familiar with the house. By a side door, he passed into the cellar. There he lighted the gas, opened one of the wine cases, and taking up all the bottles that he could conveniently carry, returned to the bathroom. There he poured the contents into the tub on the dismembered body, and then returned to the cellar with the empty bottles, which he replaced in the wine cases. This he continued to do until all the cases but one were emptied and the bathtub was more than half full of liquid. This liquid was sulfuric acid. When the sailor returned to the cellar with the last empty wine bottles, he opened the fifth case, which really contained wine, took some out of it, and poured a little into each of the empty bottles in order to remove any possible odor of the sulfuric acid. Then he turned out the gas and brought up to the bathroom with him the two paper flour sacks and the little heavy bundle. These sacks were filled with nitrate of soda. He set them down by the door, opened the little bundle, and took out two long rubber tubes, each attached to a heavy gas burner, not unlike the ordinary burners of a small gas stove. He fastened the tubes to two of the gas jets, put the burners under the tub, turned the gas on full, and lighted it. 
Then he threw into the tub the woman's clothing and the papers which he had found on her body, after which he took up the two heavy sacks of nitrate of soda and dropped them carefully into the sulfuric acid. When he had done this, he went quickly out of the bathroom and closed the door. The deadly acids at once attacked the body and began to destroy it. As the heat increased, the acids boiled, and the destructive process was rapid and awful. From time to time, the sailor opened the door of the bathroom cautiously, and holding a wet towel over his mouth and nose, looked in at his horrible work. At the end of a few hours, there was only a swimming mass in the tub. When the man looked at four o'clock, it was all a thick, murky liquid. He turned off the gas quickly and stepped back out of the room. For perhaps half an hour, he waited in the hall. Finally, when the acids had cooled so that they no longer gave off fumes, he opened the door and went in, took hold of the platinum wire, and pulling the porcelain disc from the stopcock, allowed the awful contents of the tub to run out. Then he turned on the hot water, rinsed the tub clean, and replaced the metal outlet. Removing the rubber tubes, he cut them into pieces, broke the porcelain disc, and rolling up the platinum wire, washed it all down the sewer pipe. The fumes had escaped through the open window. This he now closed and set himself to putting the bathroom in order, and efficiently removing every trace of his night's work. The sailor moved around with the very greatest degree of care. Finally, when he had arranged everything to his complete satisfaction, he picked up the two burners, turned out the gas, and left the bathroom, closing the door after him. From the bathroom he went directly to the attic, concealed the two rusty burners under a heap of rubbish, and then walked carefully and noiselessly down the stairs and through the lower hall. As he opened the door and stepped into the room where he had killed the woman, two police officers sprang out and seized him. The man screamed like a wild beast taken in a trap and sank down. Oh, oh, he cried. It was no use. It was no use to do it. Then he recovered himself in a manner and was silent. The officers handcuffed him, summoned the patrol, and took him at once to the station house. There he said he was a Mexican sailor and that his name was Victor Ancona, but he would say nothing further. The following morning he sent for Randolph Mason, and the two were long together. The obscure defendant charged with murder has little reason to complain of the law's delays. The morning following the arrest of Victor Ancona, the newspapers published long sensational articles, denounced him as a fiend, and convicted him. The grand jury, as it happened, was in session. The preliminaries were soon arranged, and the case was railroaded into trial. The indictment contained a great many counts, and charged by the prisoner with the murder of Nina San Croix by striking, stabbing, choking, poisoning, and so forth. The trial had continued for three days, and had appeared so overwhelmingly one-sided that the spectators who were crowded in the courtroom had grown to be violent and bitter partisans to such an extent that the police watched them closely. The attorneys for the people were dramatic and denunciatory, and forced their case with arrogant confidence. Mason, as counsel for the prisoner, was indifferent and listless. Throughout the entire trial, he had sat almost motionless at the table, his gaunt form bent over, his long legs drawn up under his chair, and his weary, heavy-muscled face, with its restless eyes, fixed and staring out over the heads of the jury, was like a tragic mask. The bar and even the judge believed that the prisoner's counsel had abandoned the case. The evidence was all in, and the people rested. It had been shown that Nina San Croix had resided for many years in the house in which the prisoner was arrested, that she had lived by herself with no other companion than an old negro servant, that her past was unknown, and that she received no visitors save the Mexican sailor who came to her house at long intervals. Nothing whatever was shown tending to explain who the prisoner was or whence he had come. It was shown that on Tuesday preceding the killing, the Archbishop had received a communication from Nina San Croix, in which she said she desired to make a statement of the greatest import, and asking for an audience. 
To this, the archbishop replied that he would willingly grant her a hearing if she would come to him at eleven o'clock on Friday morning. Two policemen testified that about eight o'clock on the night of Thursday, they had noticed the prisoner slip into the gate of Nina San Croix's residence and go down to the side of the house where he was admitted, that his appearance and seeming haste had attracted their attention, that they had concluded that it was some clandestine amour, and, out of courtesy, had both slipped down to the house and endeavored to find a position from which they could see into the room, but were unable to do so, and were about to go back to the street when they heard a woman's voice cry out in great anger, I know that you love her and that you want to get rid of me, but you shall not do it. You murdered him, but you shall not murder me. I have all the evidence to convict you of murdering him. The archbishop will have it to-morrow. They shall hang you. Do you hear me? They shall hang you for this murder. That thereupon one of the policemen proposed that they should break into the house and see what was wrong but the other had urged that it was only the usual lover's quarrel, and if they should interfere they would find nothing upon which a charge could be based, and would only be laughed at by the chief, that they had waited and listened for a time, but hearing nothing further, had gone back to the street, and contented themselves with keeping a strict watch on the house. The people proved further that on Thursday evening Nina San Croix had given the old negro domestic a sum of money and dismissed her, with the instruction that she was not to return until sent for. The old woman testified that she had gone directly to the house of her son, and later had discovered that she had forgotten some articles of clothing which she needed, that thereupon she had returned to the house and had gone up the back way to her room. This was about eight o'clock that while there she had heard Nina San Croix's voice in great passion, and remembered that she had used the words stated by the policeman, that these sudden, violent cries had frightened her greatly, and she had bolted the door, and been afraid to leave the room. Shortly thereafter she had heard heavy footsteps ascending the stairs, slowly and with great difficulty, as though some one were carrying a heavy burden that therefore her fear had increased, and that she had put out the light and hidden under the bed. She remembered hearing the footsteps moving about upstairs for many hours, how long she could not tell. Finally, about half-past four in the morning, she crept out, opened the door, slipped downstairs, and ran out into the street. There she had found the policemen, and requested them to search the house. The two officers had gone to the house with the woman. She had opened the door, and they had just time to step back into the shadow when the prisoner entered. When arrested, Victor Ancona had screamed with terror and cried out, It was no use! It was no use to do it! The chief of police had come to the house and instituted a careful search. In the room below, from which the cries had come, he found a dress which was identified as belonging to Nina San Croix, and which she was wearing when last seen by the domestic, about six o'clock that evening. This dress was covered with blood, and had a slit about two inches long in the left side of the bosom, into which the Mexican knife found on the prisoner fitted perfectly. These articles were introduced in evidence and it was shown that the slit would be exactly over the heart of the wearer, and that such a wound would certainly result in death. There was much blood on one of the chairs and on the floor. There was also blood on the prisoner's coat and the leg of his trousers, and the heavy Mexican knife was also bloody. The blood was shown by the experts to be human blood. The body of the woman was not found, and the most rigid and tireless search failed to develop the slightest trace of the corpse, or the manner of its disposal. The body of the woman had disappeared as completely as though it had vanished into the air. When counsel announced that he had closed for the people, the judge turned and looked gravely down at Mason. Sir, he said, the evidence for the defense may now be introduced. Randolph Mason arose slowly and faced the judge. If your honor please, he said, speaking slowly and distinctly, the defendant has no evidence to offer. He paused while a murmur of astonishment ran over the courtroom. But if your honor please, he continued, I move that the jury be directed to find the prisoner not guilty. The crowd stirred. 
The counsel for the people smiled. The judge looked sharply at the speaker over his glasses. On what ground? he said curtly. On the ground, replied Mason, that the corpus delecti has not been proven. Ah, said the judge, for once losing his judicial gravity. Mason sat down abruptly. The senior counsel for the prosecution was on his feet in a moment. What? he said. The gentleman bases his motion on a failure to establish the corpus delecti? Does he jest, or has he forgotten the evidence? The term corpus delecti is technical and means the body of the crime, or the substantial fact that a crime has been committed. Does anyone doubt it in this case? It is true that no one actually saw the prisoner kill the decedent, and that he has so successfully hidden the body that it has not been found, but the powerful chain of circumstances, clear and close-linked, proving motive, the criminal agency and the criminal act is overwhelming. The victim in this case is on the eve of making a statement that would prove fatal to the prisoner. The night before the statement is to be made, he goes to her residence. They quarrel. Her voice is heard raised high in the greatest passion, denouncing him and charging that he is a murderer, that she has the evidence and will reveal it, that he shall be hanged, and that he shall not be rid of her. Here is the motive for the crime clear as light. Are not the bloody knife, the bloody dress, the bloody clothes of the prisoner unimpeachable witness to the criminal act? The criminal agency of the prisoner has not the shadow of a possibility to obscure it. His motive is gigantic. The blood on him and his despair when arrested cry murder, murder, with a thousand tongues. Men may lie, but circumstances cannot. The thousand hopes and fears and passions of men may delude or bias the witness. Yet it is beyond the human mind to conceive that a clear, complete chain of concatenated circumstances can be in error. Hence it is that the greatest jurists have declared that such evidence, being rarely liable to delusion or fraud, is safest and most powerful. The machinery of human justice cannot guard against the remote and improbable doubt. The inference is persistent in the affairs of men. It is the only means by which the human mind reaches truth. If you forbid the jury to exercise it, you bid them work after first striking off their hands. Rule out the irresistible inference, and the end of justice is come in this land, and you may as well leave the spider to weave his web through the abandoned courtroom. The attorney stopped, looked down at Mason with a pompous sneer, and retired to his place at the table. The judge sat thoughtful and motionless. The jurymen leaned forward in their seats. "'If your honor please,' said Mason, rising, "'this is a matter of law, plain, clear, and so well settled in the state of New York that even counsel for the people should know it. The question before your honor is simple. If the corpus delecti, the body of the crime, has been proven as required by the laws of the Commonwealth, then this case should go to the jury. If not, then it is the duty of this court to direct the jury to find the prisoner not guilty. There is here no room for judicial discretion. Your Honor has but to recall and apply the rigid rule announced by our courts prescribing distinctly how the corpus delecti in murder must be proven. The prisoner here stands charged with the highest crime. The law demands first that the crime, as a fact, be established. The fact that the victim is indeed dead must first be made certain before anyone can be convicted for her killing, because, so long as there remains the remotest doubt as to the death, there can be no certainty as to the criminal agent, although the circumstantial evidence indicating the guilt of the accused may be positive, complete, and utterly irresistible. In murder, the corpus delecti, or body of the crime, is composed of two elements, death as a result the criminal agency of another as the means. It is the fixed and immutable law of this state laid down in the leading case of Ruloff versus the people, and binding upon this court, that both components of the corpus delecti shall not be established by circumstantial evidence. There must be direct proof of one or the other of these two component elements of the corpus delecti, if one is proven by direct evidence, the other may be presumed, 
but both shall not be presumed from circumstances, no matter how powerful, how cogent, or how completely overwhelming the circumstances may be. In other words, no man can be convicted of murder in the state of New York unless the body of the victim be found and identified, or there be direct proof that the prisoner did some act adequate to produce death and did it in such a manner as to account for the disappearance of the body. The face of the judge cleared and grew hard. Members of the bar were attentive and alert. They were beginning to see the legal escape open up. The audience were puzzled. They did not yet understand. Mason turned to the counsel for the people. His ugly face was bitter with contempt. For three days, he said, I have been tortured by this useless and expensive farce. If counsel for the people had been other than play actors, they would have known in the beginning that Victor Ancona could not be convicted for murder unless he were confronted in this courtroom with a living witness who had looked into the dead face of Nina San Croix, or, if not that, a living witness who had seen him drive the dagger into her bosom. I care not if the circumstantial evidence in this case were so strong and irresistible as to be overpowering, if the judge on the bench, if the jury, if every man within the sound of my voice were convinced of the guilt of the prisoner, to the degree of certainty that is absolute, if the circumstantial evidence left in the mind no shadow of the remotest improbable doubt, yet in the absence of the eyewitness, this prisoner cannot be punished, and this court must compel the jury to acquit him. The audience now understood, and they were dumbfounded. Surely this was not the law. They had been taught that the law was common sense, and this, this was anything else. Mason saw it all and grinned. In its tenderness, he sneered, the law shields the innocent. The good law of New York reaches out its hand and lifts the prisoner out of the clutches of the fierce jury that would hang him. Mason sat down. The room was silent. The jurymen looked at each other in amazement. The counsel for the people arose. His face was white with anger and incredulous. Your Honor, he said. This doctrine is monstrous. Can it be said that in order to evade punishment, the murderer has only to hide or destroy the body of the victim or sink it into the sea? Then if he is not seen to kill, the law is powerless, and the murderer can snap his finger in the face of retributive justice. If this is the law, then the law for the highest crime is a dead letter. The great commonwealth winks at murder and invites every man to kill his enemy, provided he kill him in secret and hide him. I repeat, your honor, the man's voice was now loud and angry and rang through the courtroom, that this doctrine is monstrous. So said Best, and Story, and many another, muttered Mason. And the law remained. The court, said the judge abruptly, desires no further argument. The counsel for the people resumed his seat. His face lighted up with triumph. The court was going to sustain him. The judge turned and looked down at the jury. He was grave and spoke with deliberate emphasis. Gentlemen of the jury, he said, the rule of Lord Hale obtains in this state and is binding upon me. It is the law, as stated by counsel, for the prisoner, that to warrant conviction of murder there must be direct proof either of the death, as of the finding and identification of the corpse, or of criminal violence adequate to produce death, and exerted in such a manner as to account for the disappearance of the body. And it is only when there is direct proof of the one that the other can be established by circumstantial evidence. This is the law, and cannot now be departed from. I do not presume to explain its wisdom. Chief Justice Johnson has observed in the leading case, 
that it may have its probable foundation in the idea that where direct proof is absent as to both the fact of the death and of the criminal violence capable of producing death, no evidence can rise to the degree of moral certainty that the individual is dead by criminal intervention, or even led by direct inference to this result, and that where the fact of death is not certainly ascertained, all inculpatory circumstantial evidence wants the key necessary for its satisfactory interpretation, and cannot be depended on to furnish more than probable results. It may be, also, that such a rule has some reference to the dangerous possibility that a general preconception of guilt or a general excitement of popular feeling may creep in to supply the place of evidence, if upon other than direct proof of death or a cause of death, a jury are permitted to pronounce a prisoner guilty. In this case, the body has not been found and there is no direct proof of criminal agency on the part of the prisoner although the chain of circumstantial evidence is complete and irresistible in the highest degree. Nevertheless, it is all circumstantial evidence, and under the laws of New York the prisoner cannot be punished. I have no right of discretion. The law does not permit a conviction in this case, although every one of us may be morally certain of the prisoner's guilt. I am, therefore, gentlemen of the jury, compelled to direct you to find the prisoner not guilty. Judge, interrupted the foreman, jumping up in the box, we cannot find that verdict under our oath. We know that this man is guilty. Sir, said the judge, this is a matter of law in which the wishes of the jury cannot be considered. The clerk will write a verdict of not guilty, which you, as foreman, will sign. The spectators broke out into a threatening murmur that began to grow and gather volume. The judge rapped on his desk and ordered the bailiffs promptly to suppress any demonstration on the part of the audience. Then he directed the foreman to sign the verdict prepared by the clerk. When this was done, he turned to Victor Ancona. His face was hard, and there was a cold glitter in his eyes. "'Prisoner at the bar,' he said, "'you have been put to trial before this tribunal on a charge of cold-blooded and atrocious murder. The evidence produced against you was of such powerful and overwhelming character that it seems to have left no doubt in the minds of the jury nor indeed in the mind of any person present in this courtroom. Had the question of your guilt been submitted to these twelve arbiters, a conviction would certainly have resulted, and the death penalty would have been imposed. But the law, rigid, passionless, even-eyed, has thrust in between you and the wrath of your fellows and saved you from it. I do not cry out against the impotency of the law, it is perhaps as wise as imperfect humanity could make it. I deplore, rather, the genius of evil men who by cunning design are enabled to slip through the fingers of this law. I have no word of censure or admonition for you, Victor Ancona. The law of New York compels me to acquit you. I am only its mouthpiece with my individual wishes throttled. I speak only those things which the law directs I shall speak. You are now at liberty to leave this courtroom, not guiltless of the crime of murder, perhaps, but at least rid of its punishment. The eyes of men may see Cain's mark on your brow, but the eyes of the law are blind to it. When the audience fully realized what the judge had said, they were amazed and silent. They knew as well as men could know that Victor Ancona was guilty of murder and yet he was now going out of the courtroom free. Could it happen that the law protected only against the blundering rogue? They had heard always of the boasted completeness of the law, which magistrates from time immemorial had labored to perfect. And now, when the skillful villain sought to evade it, they saw how weak a thing it was. 
The wedding march of Lohengrin floated out from the Episcopal Church of St. Mark, clear and sweet and perhaps heavy with its paradox of warning. The theater of this coming contract before high heaven was a wilderness of roses worth the taxes of a county. The high caste of Manhattan, by the grace of the checkbook, were present, clothed in Parisian purple and fine linen, cunningly and marvelously wrought. Over in her private pew, ablaze with jewels and decked with fabrics from the deft hand of many a weaver, sat Mrs. Miriam Stuvesant, as imperious and self-complacent as a queen. To her it was all a kind of triumphal procession proclaiming her ability as a general. With her were a few of the genus homo, which obtains at the five o'clock teas, instituted, say the sages, for the purpose of sprinkling the holy water of Leth. Zarina, whispered Reggie du Poister, leaning forward, I salute you. The ceremony, sub jugum, is superb. Walcott is an excellent fellow, answered Mrs. Duvisant. Not a vice, you know, Reggie. Ay, Empress, put in the others. A purist taken in the net. The clean-skirted one has come to the altar. Viva la virtu! Samuel Walcott, still sunburned from his cruise, stood before the chancel with the only daughter of the blue-blooded St. Clair's. His face was clear and honest, and his voice firm. This was life and not romance. The lid of the sepulchre had closed, and he had slipped from under it. And now and ever after the hand, red with murder, was clean as any. The minister raised his voice, proclaiming the holy union before God, and this twain, half pure, half foul, now by divine ordinance one flesh, bowed down before it. No blood cried from the ground. The sunlight of high noon streamed down through the window panes like a benediction. Back in the pew of Mrs. Miriam Stuvesant, Reggie du Poister turned down his thumb. Habet, he said, from the strange schemes of Randolph Mason, by Melvin Davison Post, copyright 1896, by G. P. Putnam's Sons. End of section six. Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume One, by Julian Hawthorne, Editor. Section seven. An heiress from Red Horse, by Ambrose Bierce. Coronado, June twentieth. I find myself more and more interested in him. It is not, I am sure, his, do you know any noun corresponding to the adjective handsome? One does not like to say beauty when speaking of a man. He is handsome enough, heaven knows, I should not even care to trust you with him, faithful of all possible wives that you are, when he looks his best, as he always does. Nor do I think the fascination of his manner has much to do with it, you recollect that the charm of art inheres in that which is undefinable, and to you and me, my dear Irene, I fancy there is rather less of that in the branch of art under consideration than to girls in their first season. I fancy I know how my fine gentleman produces many of his effects, and could, perhaps, give him a pointer on heightening them. Nevertheless, his manner is something truly delightful. I suppose what interests me chiefly is the man's brains. His conversation is the best I have ever heard, and altogether unlike anyone's else. He seems to know everything, as indeed he ought, for he has been everywhere, read everything, seen all there is to see, sometimes I think rather more than is good for him, and had acquaintance with the queerest people. And then his voice— Irene, when I hear it, I actually feel as if I ought to have paid at the door, though, of course, it is my own door. July 3rd I fear my remarks about Dr. Baritz have been, being thoughtless, very silly, or you would not have written of him with such levity, not to say disrespect. Believe me, dearest, he has more dignity and seriousness. Of the kind, I mean, which is not inconsistent with a manner sometimes playful 
and always charming, than any of the men that you and I ever met. And young Raynor, you know Raynor, at Monterey, tells me that the men all like him, and that he is treated with something like deference everywhere. There is a mystery, too, something about his connection with the Blavitsky people in northern India. Rayner either would not or could not tell me the particulars. I infer that Dr. Baritz is thought—don't you dare to laugh at me—a magician. Could anything be finer than that? An ordinary mystery is not, of course, as good as a scandal. But when it relates to dark and dreadful practices, to the exercise of unearthly powers, could anything be more piquant? It explains, too, the singular influence the man has upon me. It is the undefinable in his art, black art. Seriously, dear, I quite tremble when he looks me full in the eyes with those unfathomable orbs of his, which I have already vainly attempted to describe to you. How dreadful if we have the power to make one fall in love! Do you know if the Bavlasky crowd have that power, outside of Sepoy? July 1st the strangest thing. Last evening, while Auntie was attending one of the hotel hops, I hate them, Dr. Baritz called. It was scandalously late. I actually believe he had talked with Auntie in the ballroom, and learned from her that I was alone. I had been all the evening contriving how to worm out of him the truth about his connection with the thugs in Sepoy, and all of that black business, but the moment he fixed his eyes on me, for I admitted him, I'm ashamed to say. I was helpless. I trembled. I blushed. I— Oh, Irene, Irene, I love the man beyond expression, and you know how it is yourself. Fancy, I, an ugly duckling from Red Horse, daughter, they say, of old Calamity Jim, certainly his heiress, with no living relation, but an absurd old aunt, who spoils me a thousand and fifty ways— absolutely destitute of everything but a million dollars and a hope in Paris. I, daring to love a god like him. My dear, if I had you here, I could tear your hair out with mortification. I am convinced that he is aware of my feeling, for he stayed but a few moments, said nothing but what another man might have said half as well, and, pretending that he had an engagement, went away. I learned to-day, a little bird told me, the bell bird, that he went straight to bed. How does that strike you as evidence of exemplary habits? July 17th. That little wretch, Rayner, called yesterday, and his babble almost sent me wild. He never runs down, that is to say, when he exterminates a score of reputations, more or less, he does not pause between one reputation and the next. By the way, he inquired about you, and his manifestations of interest in you had, I confess, a good deal of resemblance. Mr. Rayner observes no game laws. Like death, which he would inflict if slander were fatal, he has all seasons for his own. But I like him, for we knew one another at Red Horse when we were young and true-hearted, and barefooted. He was known in those far fair days as Giggles. And I, oh, Irene, can you ever forgive me? I was called Gunny. God knows why, perhaps in allusion to the material of my pinafores, perhaps because the name is in alliteration with Giggles. For Gig and I were inseparable playmates, and the miners may have thought it a delicate compliment to recognize some kind of relationship between us. Later we took in a third, another of adversity's brood, who, like Garrick between tragedy and comedy, had a chronic inability to adjudicate the rival claims, to himself, of frost and famine. Between him and the grave there was seldom anything more than a single suspender and the hope of a meal, which would at the same time support life and make it insupportable. He literally picked up a precarious living for himself and an aged mother, by chloriding the dumps. That is to say, the miners permitted him to search the heaps of waste rock for such pieces of 
payor as had been overlooked and these he sacked up and sold at the syndicate mill he became a member of our firm gunny giggles and dumps thenceforth through my favor for i could not then nor can i now be indifferent to his courage and prowess in defending against giggles the immemorial right of his sex to insult a strange and unprotected female myself after old jim struck it in the calamity and i began to wear shoes and go to school and in emulation giggles took to washing his face and became jack rayner of wells fargo and co and old mrs bartz was herself chlorided to her father's dumps drifted over to san juan smith and turned stage driver and was killed by road agents and so forth why do i tell you all this dear because it is heavy on my heart because i walk the valley of humility because i am subduing myself to permanent consciousness of my unworthiness to unloose the latchet of dr baritz's shoe because oh dear oh dear there's a cousin of dumps at this hotel i haven't spoken to him i never had any acquaintance with him but do you suppose he has recognized me do please give me in your next your candid sure enough opinion about it and say you don't think so do you think he knows about me already and that is why he left me last evening when he saw that i blushed and trembled like a fool under his eyes you know i can't bribe all the newspapers and i can't go back on anybody who was good to gunny at red horse not if i'm pitched out of society into the sea so the skeleton sometimes rattles behind the door i never cared much before as you know but now now it is not the same jack rayner i am sure of he will not tell him he seems indeed to hold him in such respect as hardly to dare speak to him at all and i'm a good deal that way myself dear dear i wish i had something besides a million dollars if jack were three inches taller i'd marry him alive and go back to red horse and wear sackcloth again to the end of my miserable days july twenty fifth we had a perfectly splendid sunset last evening and i must tell you all about it i ran away from auntie and everybody and was walking alone on the beach i expect you to believe you infidel that i had not looked out of my window on the seaward side of the hotel and seen him walking alone on the beach if you are not lost to every feeling of womanly delicacy you will accept my statement without question i soon established myself under my sunshade and had for some time been gazing out dreamily over the sea when he approached walking close to the edge of the water it was ebb tide i assure you the wet sand actually brightened about his feet as he approached me he lifted his hat saying miss demmit may i sit with you or will you walk with me the possibility that neither might be agreeable seems not to have occurred to him did you ever know such assurance assurance my dear it was gall downright gall well i didn't find it wormwood and replied with my untutored red horse heart in my throat i i shall be pleased to do anything could words have been more stupid there are depths of fatuity in me friend of my soul which are simply bottomless he extended his hand smiling and i delivered mine into it without a moment's hesitation and when his fingers closed about it to assist me to my feet the consciousness that it trembled made me blush worse than the red west i got up however and after a while observing that he had not let go my hand i pulled on it a little but unsuccessfully he simply held on saying nothing but looking down into my face with some kind of a smile i didn't know how could i whether it was affectionate derisive or what for i did not look at him how beautiful he was with the red fires of the sunset burning in the depths of his eyes do you know dear if the thugs and experts of the bavlatsky region have any special kind of eyes ah uh, you should have seen his superb attitude the godlike inclination of his head 
as he stood over me after I had got upon my feet. It was a noble picture, but I soon destroyed it, for I began at once to sink again to the earth. There was only one thing for him to do, and he did it. He supported me with an arm about my waist. "'Miss Demont, are you ill?' he said. It was not an exclamation. There was neither alarm nor solicitude in it. If he had added, I suppose that is about what I am expected to say, he would hardly have expressed his sense of the situation more clearly. His manner filled me with shame and indignation, for I was suffering acutely. I wrenched my hand out of his, grasped the arm supporting me, and, pushing myself free, fell plump into the sand and sat helpless. My hat had fallen off in the struggle, and my hair tumbled about my face and shoulders in the most mortifying way. "'Go from me!' I cried, half choking. "'Oh, please, go away! You—you you thug! How dare you think that when my leg is asleep!' I actually said those identical words, and then I broke down and sobbed. Irene, I blubbered. His manner altered in an instant. I could see that much through my fingers and hair. He dropped on one knee beside me, parted the tangle of hair, and said, in the tenderest way, "'My poor girl! God knows I have not intended to pain you. How should I? I who love you. I who have loved you for—for for years and years.' He had pulled my wet hands away from my face and was covering them with kisses. My cheeks were like two coals. My whole face was flaming, and, I think, steaming. What could I do? I hid it on his shoulder. There was no other place. And, oh, my dear friend, how my leg tingled and thrilled, and how I wanted to kick. We sat so for a long time. He had released one of my hands to pass his arm about me again, and I possessed myself of my handkerchief, and was drying my eyes and my nose. I would not look up until that was done. He tried in vain to push me a little away and gaze into my eyes. Presently, when it was all right, and it had grown a bit dark, I lifted my head, looked him straight in the eyes, and smiled my best, my level best, dear. "'What do you mean?' I said. "'By years and years.' "'Dearest,' he replied, very gravely, very earnestly, in the absence of the sunken cheeks, the hollow eyes, the lank hair, the slouching gait, the rags, dirt, and youth, can you not? Will you not understand? Gunny, I'm dumps!' In a moment I was upon my feet, and he upon his. I seized him by the lapels of his coat, and peered into his handsome face, in the deepening darkness. I was breathless with excitement. "'And you are not dead?' I asked, hardly knowing what I said. "'Only dead in love, dear. I recovered from the road agent's bullet. But this, I fear, is fatal.' "'But about Jack, Mr. Rayner, don't you know—' "'I am ashamed to say, darling, that it was through that unworthy person's invitation that I came here from Vienna. Irene, they have played it upon your affectionate friends, Mary Jane Demont. P.S. The worst of it is that there is no mystery. That was an invention of Jack to arouse my curiosity and interest. James is not a thug. He solemnly assures me that in all his wanderings he has never set foot in Sepoy. End of section 7「Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 1, by Julian Hawthorne, Editor. Section 8. The Man and the Snake, by Ambrose Bierce. 1. It is a veritable report, and attested of so many, that there be now of wise and learned none to gainsay it, that ye serpent his eye hath a magnetic property, that whoso falleth into its suasion 
is drawn forth in despite of his will, and perisheth miserable by ye creature his bite. Stretched at ease upon a sofa in gown and slippers, Harker Brayton smiled as he read the foregoing sentence in old Morrister's Marvels of Science. The only marvel in the matter, he said to himself, is that the wise and learned in Morrister's day should have believed such nonsense as is rejected by most of even the ignorant in ours. A train of reflections followed, for Brayton was a man of thought, and he unconsciously lowered his book without altering the direction of his eyes. As soon as the volume had gone below the line of sight, something in an obscure corner of the room recalled his attention to his surroundings. What he saw in the shadow under his bed were two small points of light, apparently about an inch apart. They might have been reflections of the gas jet above him in metal nail heads. He gave them but little thought and resumed his reading. A moment later something, some impulse which it did not occur to him to analyze, impelled him to lower the book again and seek for what he saw before. The points of light were still there. They seemed to have become brighter than before, shining with a greenish luster which he had not at first observed. He thought, too, that they might have moved a trifle, were somewhat nearer. They were still too much in the shadow, however, to reveal their nature and origin to an indolent attention, and he resumed his reading. Suddenly something in the text suggested a thought which made him start, and dropped the book for the third time to the side of the sofa, whence, escaping from his hand, it fell sprawling to the floor, back upward. Brayton, half-risen, was staring intently into the obscurity beneath the bed, where the points of light shone with, it seemed to him, an added fire. His attention was now fully aroused, his gaze eager and imperative. It disclosed, almost directly beneath the footrail of the bed, the coils of a large serpent. The points of light were its eyes. Its horrible head, thrust flatly forth from the innermost coil and resting upon the outermost, was directed straight toward him. The definition of the wide, brutal jaw and the idiot-like forehead serving to show the direction of its malevolent gaze. The eyes were no longer merely luminous points. They looked into his own with a meaning, a malign significance. 2. A snake in a bedroom of a modern city dwelling of the better sort is happily not so common a phenomenon as to make explanation altogether needless. Marker Brayton, a bachelor of thirty-five, a scholar, idler, and something of an athlete, rich, popular, and of sound health, had returned to San Francisco from all manner of remote and unfamiliar countries. His tastes, always a trifle luxurious, had taken on an added exuberance from long privation, and the resources of even the Castle Hotel being inadequate for their perfect gratification, he had gladly accepted the hospitality of his friend, Dr. Druring, the distinguished scientist. Dr. Druring's house, a large old-fashioned one, in what was now an obscure quarter of the city, had an outer and visible aspect of reserve. It plainly would not associate with the contiguous elements of its altered environment, and appeared to have developed some of the eccentricities which come of isolation. One of these was a wing, conspicuously irrelevant in point of architecture, and no less rebellious in the matter of purpose, for it was a combination of laboratory, menagerie, and museum. It was here that the doctor indulged in the scientific side of his nature, in the study of such forms of animal life as engaged his interest and comforted his taste, which, it must be confessed, ran rather to the lower forms. For one of the higher types nimbly and sweetly to recommend itself unto his gentle senses, it had at least to retain certain rudimentary characteristics allying itself to such dragons of the prime as toads and snakes. His scientific sympathies were distinctly reptilian. He loved nature's vulgarians, 
and described himself as the Zola of zoology. His wife and daughters, not having the advantage to share his enlightened curiosity regarding the works and ways of our ill-starred fellow creatures, were, with needless austerity, excluded from what he called the snakery, and doomed to companionship with their own kind. Though to soften the rigors of their lot, he had permitted them, out of his great wealth, to outdo the reptiles in the gorgeousness of their surroundings, and to shine with a superior splendor. Architecturally, and in point of furnishing, the snake had a severe simplicity befitting the humble circumstances of its occupants, many of whom indeed could not have safely been entrusted with the liberty which is necessary to the full enjoyment of luxury, for they had the troublesome peculiarity of being alive. In their own apartments, however, they were under as little personal restraint as was compatible with their protection from the baneful habit of swallowing one another. And, as Brayton had thoughtfully been apprised, it was more than a tradition that some of them had at diverse times been found in parts of the premises where it would have embarrassed them to explain their presence. Despite the snakery and its uncanny associations, to which indeed he gave little attention, Brayton found life at the Drearing Mansion very much to his mind. 3. Beyond a smart shock of surprise and a shudder of mere loathing, Mr. Brayton was not greatly affected. His first thought was to ring the call bell and bring a servant, but, although the bell cord dangled within easy reach, he made no movement toward it. It had occurred to his mind that the act might subject him to the suspicion of fear, which he certainly did not feel. He was more keenly conscious of the incongruous nature of the situation than affected by its perils. It was revolting, but absurd. The reptile was of a species with which Brayton was unfamiliar. Its length he could only conjecture. The body at the largest visible part seemed about as thick as his forearm. In what way was it dangerous, if in any way? Was it venomous? Was it a constrictor? His knowledge of nature's danger signals did not enable him to say. He had never deciphered the code. If not dangerous, the creature was at least offensive. It was de trop, matter out of place, an impertinence. The gem was unworthy of the setting. Even the barbarous taste of our time and country, which had loaded the walls of the room with pictures, the floor with furniture, and the furniture with bric-a-brac, had not quite fitted the place for this bit of the savage life of the jungle. Besides, in supportable thought, the exhalations of its breath mingled with the atmosphere which he himself was breathing. These thoughts shaped themselves with greater or less definition in Brayton's mind, and begot action. The process is what we call consideration and decision. It is thus that we are wise and unwise. It is thus that the withered leaf in an autumn breeze shows greater or less intelligence than its fellows, falling upon the land or upon the lake. The secret of human action is an open one. Something contracts our muscles. Does it matter if we give to the preparatory molecular changes the name of will? Brayton rose to his feet and prepared to back softly away from the snake without disturbing it, if possible, and through the door. People retire so from the presence of the great, for greatness is power, and power is a menace. He knew that he could walk backward without obstruction, and find the door without error. Should the monster follow, the taste which had plastered the walls with paintings had consistently supplied a rack of murderous oriental weapons from which he could snatch one to suit the occasion. In the meantime, the snake's eyes burned with a more pitiless malevolence than ever. Brayton lifted his right foot free of the floor to step backward. That moment, he felt a strong aversion to doing so. I am accounted brave, he murmured. Is bravery, then, no more than pride? Because there are none to witness the shame, shall I retreat? He was steadying himself with his right hand upon the back of a chair, his foot suspended. "'Nonsense,' he said aloud. "'I am not so great a coward as to fear to seem to myself afraid.' He lifted the foot a little higher by slightly bending the knee, 
and thrust it sharply to the floor, an inch in front of the other. He could not think how that occurred. A trial with the left foot had the same result. It was again in advance of the right. The hand upon the chair back was grasping it. The arm was straight, reaching somewhat backward. One might have seen that he was reluctant to lose his hold. The snake's malignant head was still thrust forth from the inner coil as before, the neck level. It had not moved, but its eyes were now electric sparks, radiating an infinity of luminous needles. The man had an ashy pallor. Again he took a step forward, and another, partly dragging the chair which, when finally released, fell upon the floor with a crash. The man groaned. The snake made neither sound nor motion, but its eyes were two dazzling suns. The reptile itself was wholly concealed by them. They gave off enlarging rings of rich and vivid colors, which at their greatest expansion successively vanished like soap bubbles. They seemed to approach his very face, and anon were an immeasurable distance away. He heard somewhere the continual throbbing of a great drum, with desultory bursts of far music, inconceivably sweet, like the tones of an aeolian harp. He knew it for the sunrise melody of Memnon's statue, and thought he stood in the Nileside reeds, hearing, with exalted sense, that immortal anthem through the silence of the centuries. The music ceased. Rather, it became by insensible degrees the distant roll of a retreating thunderstorm. A landscape, glittering with sun and rain, stretched before him, arched with a vivid rainbow, framing in its giant curve a hundred visible cities. In the middle distance a vast serpent, wearing a crown, reared its head out of its voluminous convolutions and looked at him with his dead mother's eyes. Suddenly this enchanting landscape seemed to rise swiftly upward, like the drop seen at a theater, and vanished in a blank. Something struck him a hard blow upon the face and breast. He had fallen to the floor. The blood ran from his broken nose and his bruised lips. For a moment he was dazed and stunned, and lay with closed eyes, his face against the door. In a few moments he had recovered, and then realized that his fall by withdrawing his eyes, had broken the spell which held him. He felt that now, by keeping his gaze averted, he would be able to retreat. But the thought of the serpent, within a few feet of his head, yet unseen, perhaps in the very act of springing upon him and throwing its coils about his throat, was too horrible. He lifted his head, stared again into those baleful eyes, and was again in bondage. The snake had not moved, and appeared somewhat to have lost its power upon the imagination. The gorgeous illusions of a few moments before were not repeated. Beneath that flat and brainless brow, its black beady eyes simply glittered, as at first with an expression unspeakably malignant. It was as if the creature, knowing its triumph assured, had determined to practice no more alluring wiles. Now ensued a fearful scene. The man, prone upon the floor, within a yard of his enemy, raised the upper part of his body upon his elbows, his head thrown back, his legs extended to their full length. His face was white between its gouts of blood. His eyes were strained open to their uttermost expansion. There was froth upon his lips. It dropped off in flakes. Strong convulsions ran through his body, making almost serpentine undulations. He bent himself at the waist, shifting his legs from side to side, and every movement left him a little nearer to the snake. He thrust his hands forward to brace himself back, yet constantly advanced upon his elbows. 4. Dr. Dreering and his wife sat in the library. The scientist was in rare good humor. I have just obtained, by exchange with another collector, he said, a splendid specimen of the Ophiophagus. And what might that be? the lady inquired with a somewhat languid interest. Why, bless my soul, what profound ignorance! My dear, a man who ascertains after marriage that his wife does not know Greek is entitled to a divorce. 
The Ophiophagus is a snake which eats other snakes. I hope it will eat all yours, she said, absently shifting the lamp. But how does it get the other snakes? By charming them, I suppose. That is just like you, dear, said the doctor, with an affectation of petulance. You know how irritating to me is any allusion to that vulgar superstition about the snake's power of fascination. The conversation was interrupted by a mighty cry, which rang through the silent house like the voice of a demon shouting in a tomb. Again and yet again it sounded, with terrible distinctness. They sprang to their feet, the man confused, the lady pale and speechless with fright. Almost before the echoes of the last cry had died away, the doctor was out of the room, springing up the staircase two steps at a time. In the corridor in front of Brayton's chamber, he met some servants who had come from the upper floor. Together they rushed at the door without knocking. It was unfastened and gave way. Brayton lay upon his stomach on the floor, dead. His head and arms were partly concealed under the footrail of the bed. They pulled the body away, turning it upon the back. The face was daubed with blood and froth. The eyes were wide open, staring. A dreadful sight. Died in a fit, said the scientist, bending his knee and placing his hand upon the heart. While in that position he happened to glance under the bed. Good God, he added. How did this thing get in here? He reached under the bed, pulled out the snake, and flung it, still coiled, to the center of the room, whence... With a harsh, shuffling sound, it slid across the polished floor till stopped by the wall, where it lay without motion. It was a stuffed snake. Its eyes were two shoe buttons. Asna.com Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 1, by Julian Hawthorne, Editor Section 9. The Oblong Box by Edgar Allan Poe Some years ago I engaged passage from Charleston, South Carolina, to the city of New York, in the fine packet ship Independence, Captain Hardy. We were to sail on the 15th of the month, June, weather permitting, and on the 14th I went on board to arrange some matters in my stateroom. I found that we were to have a great many passengers, including a more than unusual number of ladies. On the list were several of my acquaintances, and among other names I was rejoiced to see that of Mr. Cornelius Wyatt, a young artist for whom I entertained feelings of warm friendship. He had been with me a fellow student at C. University, where we were very much together. He had the ordinary temperament of genius, and was a compound of misanthropy, sensibility, and enthusiasm. To these qualities he united the warmest and truest heart which ever beat in the human bosom. I observed that his name was carded upon three staterooms, and upon again referring to the list of passengers, I found that he had engaged passage for himself, wife, and two sisters, his own. The staterooms were sufficiently roomy, and each had two berths, one above the other. These berths, to be sure, were so exceedingly narrow as to be insufficient for more than one person. Still, I could not comprehend why there were three staterooms for these four persons. I was, just at this epoch, in one of those moody frames of mind which makes a man abnormally inquisitive about trifles, and I confess, with shame, that I busied myself in a variety of ill-bred and preposterous conjectures about this matter of the supernumerary stateroom. It was no business of mine, to be sure, but with none the less pertinacity did I occupy myself in attempts to resolve the enigma. At last I reached a conclusion which wrought in me great wonder why I had not arrived at it before. It is a servant, of course, I said. What a fool I am not sooner to have thought of so obvious a solution. And then I again repaired to the list, but here I saw distinctly that no servant was to come with the party although, in fact, it had been the original design to bring one, for the words, and servant, had been first written and then overscored. Oh, extra baggage, to be sure, I now said to myself, something he wishes not to be put in the hold. 
something to be kept under his own eye. Ah, I have it, a painting or so. And this is what he has been bargaining about with Nicolino, the Italian Jew. This idea satisfied me, and I dismissed my curiosity for the nonce. Wyatt's two sisters I knew very well, and most amiable and clever girls they were. His wife he had newly married, and I had never yet seen her. He had often talked about her in my presence, however, and in his usual style of enthusiasm. He described her as of surpassing beauty, wit, and accomplishment. I was, therefore, quite anxious to make her acquaintance. On the day in which I visited the ship, the 14th, Wyatt and party were also to visit it, so the captain informed me, and I waited on board an hour longer than I had designed, in hope of being presented to the bride, but then an apology came. Mrs. W. was a little indisposed, and would decline coming on board until tomorrow, at the hour of sailing. The morrow, having arrived, I was going from my hotel to the wharf, when Captain Hardy met me, and said that, owing to circumstances— a stupid but convenient phrase. He rather thought the independence would not sail for a day or two, and that when all was ready he would send up and let me know. This I thought strange, for there was a stiff southerly breeze, but as the circumstances were not forthcoming, although I pumped for them with much perseverance, I had nothing to do but to return home and digest my impatience at leisure. I did not receive the expected message from the captain for nearly a week. It came at length, however, and I immediately went on board. The ship was crowded with passengers, and everything was in a bustle, attended upon making sail. Wyatt's party arrived in about ten minutes after myself. There were two sisters, the bride, and the artist, the latter in one of his customary fits of moody misanthropy. I was too well used to these, however, to pay them any special attention. He did not even introduce me to his wife, this courtesy devolving perforce upon his sister Marian, a very sweet and intelligent girl, who in a few hurried words made us acquainted. Mrs. Wyatt had been closely veiled, and when she raised her veil, in acknowledging my bow, I confess that I was very profoundly astonished. I should have been much more so, however, had not long experience advised me not to trust, with too implicit a reliance, the enthusiastic description of my friend, the artist, when indulging in comments upon the loveliness of women. When beauty was the theme, I well knew with what facility he soared into the regions of the purely ideal. The truth is, I could not help regarding Mrs. Wyatt as a decidedly plain-looking woman. If not positively ugly, she was not, I think, very far from it. She was dressed, however, in exquisite taste, and then I had no doubt that she had captivated my friend's heart by more enduring graces of the intellect and soul. She said very few words, and passed at once into her state-room with Mr. W. My old inquisitiveness now returned. There was no servant, that was a settled point. I looked, therefore, for the extra baggage. After some delay, a cart arrived at the wharf, with an oblong pine box which was everything that seemed to be expected. Immediately upon its arrival we made sail, and in a short time were safely over the bar and standing out to sea. The box in question was, as I say, oblong. It was about six feet in length by two and a half in breadth. I observed it attentively and liked to be precise. Now this shape was peculiar, and no sooner had I seen it than I took credit to myself for the accuracy of my guessing. I had reached the conclusion, it will be remembered, that the extra baggage of my friend, the artist, would prove to be pictures, or at least a picture, for I knew he had been for several weeks in conference with Nicolino, and now here was a box, which, from its shape, could possibly contain nothing in the world but a copy of Leonardo's Last Supper and a copy of this very last supper, done by Rubini the Younger at Florence, I had known for some time to be in the possession of Nicolino. This point, therefore, I considered as sufficiently settled. I chuckled excessively when I thought of my acumen. It was the first time I had ever known Wyatt to keep from me any of his artistic secrets, but here he evidently intended to steal a march upon me, and smuggle a fine picture to New York, 
under my very nose, expecting me to know nothing of the matter. I resolved to quiz him well, now and hereafter. One thing, however, annoyed me not a little. The box did not go into the extra stateroom. It was deposited in Wyatt's own, and there, too, it remained occupying very nearly the whole of the floor. No doubt to the exceeding discomfort of the artist and his wife, this the more especially as the tar or paint with which it was lettered in sprawling capitals emitted a strong, disagreeable, and to my fancy a peculiarly disgusting odour. On the lid were painted the words, Mrs. Adelaide Curtis, Albany, New York, charge of Cornelius Wyatt, Esquire, this side up, to be handled with care. Now I was aware that Mrs. Adelaide Curtis of Albany was the artist's wife's mother, but then I looked upon the whole address as a mystification, intended especially for myself. I made up my mind, of course, that the box and the contents would never get farther north than the studio of my misanthropic friend in Chambers Street, New York. For the first three or four days we had fine weather, although the wind was dead ahead, having chopped round to the northward immediately upon our losing sight of the coast. The passengers were, consequently, in high spirits and disposed to be social. I must accept, however, Wyatt and his sisters, who behaved stiffly, and, I could not help thinking, uncourteously to the rest of the party. Wyatt's conduct I did not so much regard. He was gloomy, even beyond his usual habit. In fact, he was morose, but in him I was prepared for eccentricity. For the sisters, however, I could make no excuse. They secluded themselves in their staterooms, during the greater part of the passage, and absolutely refused, although I repeatedly urged them, to hold communication with any person on board. Mrs. Wyatt herself was far more agreeable, that is to say, she was chatty, and to be chatty is no slight recommendation at sea. She became excessively intimate with most of the ladies and to my profound astonishment, evinced no equivocal disposition to coquette with the men. She amused us all very much. I say amused, and scarcely know how to explain myself. The truth is, I soon found that Mrs. W. was far more oftener laughed at than with. The gentlemen said little about her, but the ladies in a little while pronounced her a good-hearted thing, rather indifferent-looking, totally uneducated and decidedly vulgar. The great wonder was how Wyatt had been entrapped into such a match. Wealth was the general solution, but this I knew to be no solution at all, for Wyatt had told me that she neither brought him a dollar nor had any expectation from any source whatever. He had married, he said, for love and for love only, and his bride was far more than worthy of his love. When I thought of these expressions on the part of my friend, I confess that I felt indescribably puzzled. Could it be possible that he was taking leave of his senses? What else could I think? He, so refined, so intellectual, so fastidious, with so exquisite a perception of the faulty, and so keen an appreciation of the beautiful. To be sure, the lady seemed especially fond of him particularly so in his absence, when she made herself ridiculous by frequent quotations of what had been said by her beloved husband, Mr. Wyatt. The word husband seemed forever to use one of her own delicate expressions, forever on the tip of her tongue. In the meantime it was observed by all on board that he avoided her in the most pointed manner, and for the most part shut himself up alone in his stateroom, where, in fact, he might have been said to live altogether, leaving his wife at full liberty to amuse herself, as she thought best, in the public society of the main cabin. My conclusion, from what I saw and heard, was that the artist, by some unaccountable freak of fate, or perhaps in some fit of enthusiastic and fanciful passion, had been induced to unite himself with a person altogether beneath him, and that the natural result, entire and speedy disgust, had ensued. I pitied him from the bottom of my heart, but could not, for that reason, quite forgive his incommunicativeness in the matter of the Last Supper, for this I resolved to have my revenge. One day he came upon deck, and taking his arm as had been my wont, I sauntered with him back and forward. His gloom, however, which I considered quite natural under any circumstances, 
seemed entirely unabated. He said little, and that moodily, and with evident effort. I ventured a jest or two, and he made a sickening attempt at a smile. Poor fellow! As I thought of his wife, I wondered that he could have heart to put on even the semblance of mirth. At last I ventured a home thrust. I determined to commence a series of covert insinuations or innuendos about the oblong box, just to let him perceive, gradually, that I was not altogether the butt or victim of his little bit of pleasant mystification. My first observation was by the way of opening a masked battery. I said something about the peculiar shape of that box, and as I spoke the words, I smiled knowingly, winked, and touched him gently with my forefinger in the ribs. The manner in which Wyatt received this harmless pleasantry convinced me at once that he was mad. At first he stared at me, as if he found it impossible to comprehend the witticism of my remark, but as its point seemed slowly to make its way into his brain, his eyes, in the same proportion, seemed protruding from their sockets. Then he grew very red, then hideously pale, then, as if highly amused with what I had insinuated, he began a loud and boisterous laugh, which to my astonishment he kept up with gradually increasing vigour for ten minutes or more. In conclusion he fell flat and heavily upon the deck. When I ran to uplift him, to all appearance he was dead. I called assistance, and with much difficulty we brought him to himself. Upon reviving he spoke incoherently for some time. At length we bled him and put him to bed. The next morning he was quite recovered, so far as regarded his mere bodily health. Of his mind I say nothing, of course. I avoided him during the rest of the passage, by advice of the captain, who seemed to coincide with me altogether in my views of his insanity, but cautioned me to say nothing on this head to any person on board. Several circumstances occurred immediately after this fit of Wyatt's, which contributed to heighten the curiosity which I was already possessed. Among other things, this, I had been nervous, drank too much strong green tea, and slept ill at night. In fact, for two nights I could not be properly said to sleep at all. Now my stateroom opened into the main cabin, or dining-room, as did those of all the single men on board. Wyatt's three rooms were in the after-cabin, which was separated from the main one by a slight sliding door, never locked even at night. As we were almost constantly on a wind, and the breeze was not a little stiff, the ship heeled to leeward very considerably, and whenever her starboard side was to leeward, the sliding door between the cabins slid open, and so remained, nobody taking the trouble to get up and shut it. But my berth was in such a position that when my own stateroom door was open, as well as the sliding door in question, and my own door was always open on account of the heat, I could see into the after-cabin quite distinctly, and just at that portion of it too, where were situated the staterooms of Mr. Wyatt. Well, during the two nights, not consecutive, while I lay awake, I clearly saw Mrs. W., about eleven o'clock upon each night, steal cautiously from the stateroom of Mr. W., and enter the extra room, where she remained until daybreak, when she was called by her husband and went back. That they were virtually separated was clear. They had separate apartments, no doubt in contemplation of a more permanent divorce, and here, after all, I thought was the mystery of the extra room. There was another circumstance, too, which interested me much. During the two wakeful nights in question, and immediately after the disappearance of Mrs. Wyatt into the extra stateroom, I was attracted by certain singular cautious subdued noises in that of her husband. After listening to them for some time, with thoughtful attention, I at length succeeded perfectly in translating their import. There were sounds occasioned by the artist in prying open the oblong box, by means of a chisel and a mallet, the latter being apparently muffled or deadened by some soft woollen or cotton substance in which its head was enveloped. In this manner I fancied I could distinguish the precise moment when he fairly disengaged the lid, also that I could determine when he removed it altogether, and when he deposited upon the lower berth in his room, this latter point I knew, for example, by certain slight taps which the lid made in striking against the wooden edges of the berth, 
as he endeavoured to lay it down very gently, there being no room for it on the floor. After this there was a dead stillness, and I heard nothing more, upon either occasion, until nearly daybreak, unless, perhaps, I may mention a low sobbing or murmuring sound, so very much suppressed as to be nearly inaudible, if indeed the whole of this latter noise were not rather produced by my own imagination. I say it seemed to resemble sobbing or sighing, but of course it could not have been either. I rather think it was a ringing in my own ears. Mr. Wyatt, no doubt, according to custom, was merely giving the rein to one of his hobbies, indulging in one of his fits of artistic enthusiasm. He had opened his oblong box, in order to feast his eyes on the pictorial treasure within. There was nothing in this, however, to make him sob. I repeat, therefore, that it must have been simply a freak of my own fancy, distempered by good Captain Hardy's green tea. Just before dawn, on each of the two nights of which I speak, I distinctly heard Mr. Wyatt replace the lid upon the oblong box, and force the nails into their old places by means of the muffled mallet. Having done this, he issued from his stateroom, fully dressed, and proceeded to call Mrs. W. from hers. We had been at sea seven days, and were now off Cape Hatteras, when there came a tremendously heavy blow from the south-west. We were, in a measure, prepared for it, however, as the weather had been holding out threats for some time. Everything was made snug, alow and aloft, and as the wind steadily freshened, we lay to at length, under spanker and foretop sail, both double-reefed. In this trim we rode safely enough for forty-eight hours, the ship proving herself an excellent sea-boat in many respects, and shipping no water of any consequence. At the end of this period, however, the gale had freshened into a hurricane, and our after-sail split into ribbons, bringing us so much in the trough of the water that we shipped several prodigious seas, one immediately after the other. By this accident we lost three men overboard with the caboose, and nearly the whole of the larboard bulwarks. Scarcely had we recovered our senses before the foretop sail went into shreds, when we got up a storm stay sail, and with this did pretty well for some hours, the ship heading the sea much more steadily than before. The gale still held on, however, and we saw no signs of its abating. The rigging was found to be ill-fitted, and greatly strained and on the third day of the blow, about five in the afternoon, our mizzen mast, in a heavy lurch to windward, went by the board. For an hour or more we tried in vain to get rid of it, on account of the prodigious rolling of the ship, and before we had succeeded, the carpenter came aft and announced four feet water in the hold. To add to our dilemma, we found the pumps choked and nearly useless. All was now confusion and despair but an effort was made to lighten the ship by throwing overboard as much of her cargo as could be reached, and by cutting away the two masts that remained. This we at last accomplished, but we were still unable to do anything at the pumps, and in the meantime the leak gained on us very fast. At sundown the gale had sensibly diminished in violence, and as the sea went down with it, we still entertained faint hopes of saving ourselves in the boats. At 8 p.m. the clouds broke away to windward, and we had the advantage of a full moon, a piece of good fortune which served wonderfully to cheer our drooping spirits. After incredible labour, we succeeded at length in getting the longboat over the side without material accident, and into this we crowded the whole of the crew and most of the passengers. This party made off immediately, and after undergoing much suffering, finally arrived in safety at Ocracoke Inlet on the third day after the wreck. Fourteen passengers, with the captain, remained on board resolving to trust their fortunes to the jolly boat at the stern. We lowered it without difficulty, although it was only by a miracle that we prevented it from swamping as it touched the water. It contained, when afloat, the captain and his wife, Mr. Wyatt and party, a Mexican officer, wife, four children, and myself, with a negro valet. We had no room, of course, for anything except a few positively necessary instruments, some provisions, and the clothes upon our backs. No one had thought of even attempting to save anything more. What must have been the astonishment of all, then, when, having proceeded a few fathoms from the ship, Mr. Wyatt stood up in the stern sheets, 
and coolly demanded of Captain Hardy that the boat should be put back for the purpose of taking in his oblong box. "'Sit down, Mr. Wyatt,' replied the captain, somewhat sternly. "'You will capsize us if you do not sit quite still. Our gunwale is almost in the water now.' "'The box!' vociferated Mr. Wyatt, still standing. "'The box, I say. Captain Hardy, you cannot, you will not refuse me. Its weight will be but a trifle. It is nothing, mere nothing. By the mother who bore you, for the love of heaven, by your hope of salvation, I implore you to put back for the box.' The captain, for a moment, seemed touched by the earnest appeal of the artist, but he regained his stern composure, and merely said, "'Mr. Wyatt, you are mad. I cannot listen to you. Sit down, I say, or you will swamp the boat. Stay! Hold him! Seize him! He is about to spring overboard! There! I knew it! He is over!' As the captain said this, Mr. Wyatt, in fact, sprang from the boat, and as we were yet in the lee of the wreck, succeeded by almost superhuman exertion in getting hold of a rope which hung from the forechains. In another moment he was on board and rushing frantically down into the cabin. In the meantime we had been swept astern of the ship, and being quite out of her lee, were at the mercy of the tremendous sea which was still running. We made a determined effort to put back, but our little boat was like a feather in the breath of the tempest, we saw at a glance that the doom of the unfortunate artist was sealed. As our distance from the wreck rapidly increased, the madman, for as such only could we regard him, was seen to emerge from the companionway, up which by dint of strength that appeared gigantic, he dragged bodily the oblong box. While we gazed in the extreme of astonishment, he passed rapidly several turns of a three-inch rope, first around the box and then around his body. In another instant both body and the box were in the sea, disappearing suddenly at once and for ever. We lingered a while sadly upon our oars, with our eyes riveted upon the spot. At length we pulled away. The silence remained unbroken for an hour. Finally I hazarded a remark. Did you observe, Captain, how suddenly they sank? Was not that an exceedingly singular thing? I confess that I entertained some feeble hope of his final deliverance, when I saw him lash himself to the box, and commit himself to the sea. They sank as a matter of course, replied the captain, and that like a shot. They will soon rise again, however, but not till the salt melts. The salt, I ejaculated. Hush, said the captain, pointing to the wife and sister of the deceased. We must talk of these things at some more appropriate time. We suffered much and made a narrow escape, but fortune befriended us as well as our mates in the longboat. We landed, in fine, more dead than alive, after four days of intense distress, upon the beach opposite Roanoke Island. We remained here a week, were not ill-treated by the wreckers, and at length obtained a passage to New York. About a month after the loss of the independence, I happened to meet Captain Hardy in Broadway. Our conversation turned, naturally, upon the disaster, and especially upon the sad fate of poor Wyatt. I thus learned the following particulars. The artist had engaged passage for himself, wife, two sisters, and a servant. His wife was, indeed, as she had been presented, a most lovely and most accomplished woman. On the morning of the 14th of June, the day in which I first visited the ship, the lady suddenly sickened and died. The young husband was frantic with grief, but circumstances imperatively forbade the deferring of his voyage to New York. It was necessary to take to her mother the corpse of his adored wife, and on the other hand the universal prejudice which would prevent his doing so, openly, was well known. Nine-tenths of the passengers would have abandoned the ship rather than take passage with a dead body. In this dilemma, Captain Hardy arranged that the corpse, being first partially embalmed and packed with a large quantity of salt in a box of suitable dimensions, should be conveyed on board as merchandise. Nothing was to be said of the lady's decease, and as it was well understood that Mr. Wyatt had engaged passage for his wife, it became necessary that some person should personate her during the voyage. This the deceased lady's maid was easily prevailed on to do. 
the extra stateroom originally engaged for this girl during her mistress's life was now merely retained in this stateroom the pseudo wife slept of course every night in the daytime she performed to the best of her ability the part of her mistress whose person it had been carefully ascertained was unknown to any of the passengers on board my own mistake arose naturally enough through too careless too inquisitive and too impulsive a temperament but of late it is a rare thing that i sleep soundly at night there is a countenance which haunts me turn as i will there is an hysterical laugh which will forever ring within my ears End of the Oblong Box Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories Volume 1 by Julian Hawthorne, Editor Section 10 The Gold Bug, Part 1 by Edgar Allan Poe What ho, what ho, this fellow is dancing mad. He hath been bitten by the tarantula all in the wrong many years ago i contracted an intimacy with a mr william legrand he was of an ancient huguenot family and had once been wealthy but a series of misfortunes had reduced him to want to avoid the mortification consequent upon his disasters he left new orleans the city of his forefathers and took up his residence at sullivan's island near charleston south carolina this island is a very singular one. It consists of little else than the sea land, and is about three miles long. Its breadth at no point exceeds a quarter of a mile. It is separated from the mainland by a scarcely perceptible creek, oozing its way through a wilderness of reeds and slime, a favorite resort of the marsh hen. The vegetation, as might be supposed, is scant, or at least dwarfish no trees of any magnitude are to be seen near the western extremity where fort moultrie stands and where are some miserable frame buildings tenanted during summer by the fugitives from charleston dust and fever may be found indeed the bristly palmetto but the whole island with the exception of this western point and a line of hard white beach on the sea-coast is covered with a dense undergrowth of the sweet myrtle so much prized by the horticulturists of england the shrub here often attains the height of fifteen or twenty feet and forms an almost impenetrable coppice burdening the air with its fragrance in the inmost recesses of this coppice not far from the eastern or more remote end of the island legrand had built himself a small hut which he occupied when i first by mere accident made his acquaintance this soon ripened into friendship, for there was much in the recluse to excite interest and esteem. I found him well educated, with unusual powers of mind, but infected with misanthropy, and subject to perverse moods of alternate enthusiasm and melancholy. He had with him many books, but rarely employed them. His chief amusements were gunning and fishing, or sauntering along the beach, and through the myrtles in quest of shells or entomological specimens his collection of the latter might have been envied by a swammer dam in these excursions he was usually accompanied by an old negro called jupiter who had been manumitted before the reverses of the family but who could be induced neither by threats nor by promises to abandon what he considered his right of attendance upon the footsteps of his young massa will it is not improbable that the relatives of Legrand, conceiving him to be somewhat unsettled in intellect, had contrived to instill this obstinacy into Jupiter, with a view to the supervision and guardianship of the wanderer. The winters in the latitude of Sullivan's Island are seldom very severe, and in the fall of the year it is a rare event indeed when a fire is considered necessary. About the middle of October, 18, blank, there occurred, however, a day of remarkable chilliness. Just before sunset, I scrambled my way through the evergreens to the hut of my friend, whom I had not visited for several weeks, my residence being at that time in Charleston, 
a distance of nine miles from the island, while the facilities of passage and repassage were very far behind those of the present day. Upon reaching the hut I rapped, as was my custom, and getting no reply, sought for the key, where I knew it was secreted, unlocked the door, and went in. A fine fire was blazing upon the hearth. It was a novelty, and by no means an ungrateful one. I threw off an overcoat, took an armchair by the crackling logs, and awaited patiently the arrival of my hosts. Soon after dark they arrived, and gave me a most cordial welcome. Jupiter, grinning from ear to ear, bustled about to prepare some marsh hens for supper. Legrand was in one of his fits, how else shall I term them, of enthusiasm. He had found an unknown bivalve, forming a new genus, and, more than this, he had hunted down and secured, with Jupiter's assistance, a scarabaeus, which he believed to be totally new, but in respect to which he wished to have my opinion on the morrow. "'And why not to-night?' I asked, rubbing my hands over the blaze, and wishing the whole tribe of Scarabai at the devil. "'Ah, if I had only known you were here!' said Legrand. "'But it's so long since I saw you, and how could I foresee that you would pay me a visit this very night of all others? As I was coming home I met Lieutenant G. from the fort, and very foolishly I lent him the bug. So it will be impossible for you to see it until the morning. Stay here to-night, and I will send up down for it at sunrise. It is the loveliest thing in creation. What? Sunrise? Nonsense! No, the bug! It is of a brilliant gold collar, about the size of a large hickory nut, with two jet black spots near one extremity of the back, and another somewhat longer at the other. The antenna are— They ain't no tin in him, Massa Will. I keep a tellin' on you. Here interrupted Jupiter. De bug is a ghoul bug, solid, every bit of him, inside and all. Sep him wing, never feel half so heavy a bug in my life. Well, suppose it is, Jup, replied Legrand, somewhat more earnestly, it seemed to me, than the case demanded. Is that any reason for your letting the birds burn? The color, here he turned to me, is really almost enough to warrant Jupiter's idea. You never saw a more brilliant metallic luster than the scales emit. But of this you cannot judge till tomorrow. In the meantime I can give you some idea of the shape. Saying this, he seated himself at a small table on which were a pen and ink, but no paper. He looked for some in a drawer but found none. "'Never mind,' he said at length. "'This will answer.' And he drew from his waistcoat pocket a scrap of what I took to be very dirty full scrap, and made upon it a rough drawing with the pen. While he did this, I retained my seat by the fire, for I was still chilly. When the design was complete, he handed it to me without rising. As I received it, a loud growl was heard, succeeded by a scratching, at the door. Jupiter opened it, and a large Newfoundland, belonging to Legrand, rushed in, leaped upon my shoulders, and loaded me with caresses, for I had shown him much attention during previous visits. When his gambols were over, I looked at the paper, and, to speak the truth, found myself not a little puzzled at what my friend had depicted. Well, I said, after contemplating it for some minutes, this is a strange scarabus, I must confess, new to me. Never saw anything like it before, unless it was a skull or a death's head, which it more nearly resembles than anything else that has come under my observation. A death's head, echoed Legrand. Oh, yes. Well, it has something of that appearance on paper, no doubt. The two upper black spots look like eyes, eh? and the longer one at the bottom like a mouth? And then the shape of the whole is oval. Perhaps so, said I. But, Legrand, I fear you are no artist. I must wait until I see the beetle itself, 
if I am to form any idea of its personal appearance. "'Well, I don't know,' said he, a little nettled. "'I draw tolerably. Should, do it at least, have had good masters and flatter myself that I am not quite a blockhead.' "'But, my dear fellow, you are joking, then,' said I. "'This is a very passable skull, indeed. I may say that it is a very excellent skull.' according to the vulgar notions about such specimens of physiology, and your scarabus must be the queerest scarabus in the world if it resembles it. Why, we may get up a very thrilling bit of superstition upon this hint. I presume you will call the bug scarabus caput hominis, or something of that kind. There are many similar titles in the natural histories. But what are the antenna you spoke of? The antenna? said Legrand, who seemed to be getting unaccountably warm upon the subject. I am sure you must see the antenna. I made them as distinct as they are in the original insect, and I presume that is sufficient. Well, well, I said, perhaps you have. Still I don't see them. As I handed him the paper without additional remark, not wishing to ruffle his temper, but I was much surprised at the turn affairs had taken. His ill-humour puzzled me. And, as for the drawing of the beetle, there were positively no antenna visible, and the whole did bear a very close resemblance to the ordinary cuts of a death's head. He received the paper very peevishly, and was about to crumple it, apparently to throw it in the fire, when a casual glance at the design seemed suddenly to rivet his attention. In an instant his face grew violently red, in another excessively pale. For some minutes he continued to scrutinize the drawing minutely where he sat. At length he arose, took a candle from the table, and proceeded to seat himself upon a sea-chest in the farthest corner of the room. Here again he made an anxious examination of the paper turning it in all directions. He said nothing, however, and his conduct greatly astonished me. Yet I thought it prudent not to exacerbate the growing moodiness of his temper by any comments. Presently he took from his coat pocket a wallet, placed the paper carefully in it, and deposited both in a writing desk, which he locked. He now grew more composed in his demeanour, but his original air of enthusiasm had quite disappeared. Yet he seemed not so much sulky as abstracted. As the evening wore away, he became more and more absorbed in reverie, from which no sallies of mine could arouse him. It had been my intention to pass the night at the hut, as I had frequently done before, but, seeing my host in this mood, I deemed it proper to take leave. He did not press me to remain, but as I departed he shook my hand with even more than his usual cordiality. It was about a month after this, and during the interval I had seen nothing of Legrand, when I received a visit, at Charleston, from his man Jupiter. I had never seen the old negro look so dispirited, and I feared that some serious disaster had befallen my friend. Well, Jupp, said I, what is the matter now? How is your master? Why, to speak the truth, massa, him not so very well as mought be. Not well? I am truly sorry to hear it. What does he complain of? Dar, dot's it. Him never plain o' nothing. But him very sick for all dat. Very sick? Jupiter, why didn't you say so at once? Is he confined to bed? No, dat he ain't. He ain't find nowhere. Dat's just where de shoe pinch. My mind has got to be very heavy bout poor Massa Will. Jupiter, I should like to understand what it is you are talking about. You say your master is sick. Hasn't he told you what ails him? Why, Massa, tain't wolf while, for to get mad about the matter. Massa Will say nothin' at all ain't the matter with him. But then what make him go about looking dis here way, with his head down, and his shoulders up, and as white as a goose? And den he keep a siphon all the time. 
Keep a what, Jupiter? Keeps a siphon, with the figures on the slate. Queerest figures I ever did see. I is getting to be scared, I tell you. Hab for to keep mighty tight eye upon him nivers. Totter day he give me slip, for the sun up, and was gone the whole ob de blessed day. I had a big stick ready cut, for to give him deuced good beat when he did come. But I was such a fool that I hadn't a heart at all. He looked so very poorly. Eh? What? Ah, yes. Upon the whole, I think you had better not be too severe with the poor fellow. Don't flog him, Jupiter. He can't very well stand it. But you can form no idea of what has occasioned this illness, or rather this change of conduct. Has anything unpleasant happened since I saw you? No, massa. Dey ain't been nothing unpleasant since den. Twas for den I'm feared. Twas the buried day you was there. How? What do you mean? Why, massa? I mean de bug there now. The what? De bug. I'm very sartin dat massa will been bit somewhere about the head by dat ghoul bug. And what cause have you, Jupiter, for such a supposition? Claws enough, massa, and mouth too. I never did see such a deuced bug. He kick and he bite everything what come near him. Massa will caught him fuss, but had for to let him go again mighty quick. I tell you, den was the time he must have got to bite. I didn't like to look up the bug mouth myself, no how, so I wouldn't take hold of him with my finger. But I caught him with a piece of paper that I found. I wrap him up in the paper and stuff a piece of it in he mouth. Dat was de way. And you think, then, that your master was really bitten by the beetle, and that the beetle made him sick? I don't think nothing about it. I knows it. What make him dream bout de ghoul so much, if tain't cause he bit by de gold bug? I's heerd bout dem gold bugs for dis. But how do you know he dreams about golds? How I know? Why, cause he talk about it in his sleep. That's how I knows. Well, Jupp, perhaps you are right. But to what fortunate circumstance am I to attribute the honor of a visit from you to-day? What de matter, Massa? Did you bring any message from Mr. Legrand? No, Massa. I bring dis here pistol. And here Jupiter handed me a note, which ran thus. My dear blank, why have I not seen you for so long a time? I hope you have not been so foolish as to take offence at any little brusquerie of mine. But no, that is improbable. Since I saw you, I have had great cause for anxiety. I have something to tell you, yet scarcely know how to tell it, or whether I should tell it at all. I have not been quite well for some days past, and poor old Jupp annoys me, almost beyond endurance, by his well-meant attentions. Would you believe it, he had prepared a huge stick, the other day, with which to chastise me for giving him the slip, and spending the day, solace, among the hills on the mainland. I verily believe that my ill looks alone saved me from a flogging. I have made no addition to my cabinet since we met. If you can in any way make it convenient, come over with Jupiter. Do come. I wish to see you to-night, upon business of importance. I assure you that it is of the highest importance. Ever yours, William Legrand. There was something in the tone of this note which gave me great uneasiness. Its whole style differed materially from that of Legrand. What could he be dreaming of? What new crotchet possessed his excitable brain? What business of the highest importance could he possibly have to transact? Jupiter's account of him boded no good. I dreaded lest the continued pressure of misfortune had, at length, fairly unsettled the reason of my friend. Without a moment's hesitation, therefore, I prepared to accompany the negro. Upon reaching the wharf, I noticed a scythe and three spades, all apparently new, laying in the bottom of the boat in which we were to embark. "'What is the meaning of all this, Jupp?' I inquired. 
Him scythe, massa, and spade. Very true, but what are they doing here? Him to scythe and to spade what massa will, sis pawn me buyin' for him into town. And de devil's own lot o' money I had to give for him. But what, in the name of all that is mysterious, is your massa will going to do with skies and spades? Dat's more dan I know, and devil take me if I don't believe tis more dan he know too. But it's all come of de bug. Finding that no satisfaction was to be obtained of Jupiter, whose whole intellect seemed to be absorbed by de bug, I now stepped into the boat and made sail. With a fair and strong breeze, we soon ran into the little cove to the northward of Fort Moultrie, and a walk of some two miles brought us to the hut. It was about three in the afternoon when we arrived. Legrand had been awaiting us in eager expectation. He grasped my hand with a nervous impressment which alarmed me and strengthened the suspicions already entertained. His countenance was pale, even to ghastliness, and his deep-set eyes glared with unnatural luster. After some inquiries respecting his health, I asked him, not knowing what better to say, if he had yet obtained the scarabus from Lieutenant G. Oh, yes, he replied, coloring violently. I got it from him the next morning. Nothing should tempt me to part with that scarabus. Do you know that Jupiter is quite right about it? In what way? I asked, with a sad foreboding at heart. In supposing it to be a bug of real gold. He said this with an air of profound seriousness, and I felt inexpressibly shocked. This bug is to make my fortune, he continued with a triumphant smile, to reinstate me in my family possessions. Is it any wonder, then, that I prize it? Since fortune has thought fit to bestow it upon me, I have only to use it properly, and I shall arrive at the gold of which it is the index. Jupiter, bring me that scarabus. What? De bug, massa? I'd rather not go for trouble dat bug. You must get him for your own self. Hereupon Legrand rose, with a grave and stately air, and brought me the beetle from a glass case in which it was enclosed. It was a beautiful scarabus, and, at that time, unknown to naturalists, of course a great prize in the scientific point of view. There were two round black spots near one extremity of the back, and a long one near the other. The scales were exceedingly hard and glossy, with all the appearance of burnished gold. The weight of the insect was very remarkable, and, taking all things into consideration, I could hardly blame Jupiter for his opinion respecting it. But what to make of Legrand's concordance? With that opinion, I could not, for the life of me, tell. I sent for you, said he, in a grandiloquent tone, when I had completed my examination of the beetle, I sent for you that I might have your counsel and assistance in furthering the views of fate and of the bug. My dear Legrand, I cried, interrupting him, you are certainly unwell, and had better use some little precautions. You shall go to bed, and I will remain with you a few days until you get over this. You are feverish, and— Feel my pulse, said he. I felt it, and, to say the truth, found not the slightest indication of fever. But you may be ill and yet have no fever. Allow me this once to prescribe for you. In the first place go to bed, in the next— You are mistaken, he interposed. I am as well as I can expect to be under the excitement which I suffer. If you really wish me well, you will relieve this excitement. And how is this to be done? Very easily. Jupiter and myself are going upon an expedition into the hills, upon the mainland, and in this expedition we shall need the aid of some person in whom we can confide. You are the only one we can trust. Whether we succeed or fail, the excitement which you now perceive in me will be equally allayed. I am anxious to oblige you in any way, I replied, 
but do you mean to say that this infernal beetle has any connection with your expedition into the hills it has then legrand i can become a party to no such absurd proceeding i am sorry very sorry for we shall have to try it by ourselves try it by yourselves the man is surely mad but stay how long do you propose to be absent probably all night we shall start immediately and be back at all events by sunrise and will you promise me upon your honour that when this freak of yours is over and the bug business good god settled to your satisfaction you will then return home and follow my advice implicitly as that of your physician yes i promise and now let us be off for we have no time to lose with a heavy heart i accompanied my friend we started about four o'clock legrand jupiter the dog and myself jupiter had with him the scythe and spades the whole of which he insisted upon carrying more through fear it seemed to me of trusting either of the implements within reach of his master than from any excess of industry or complaisance his demeanour was dogged in the extreme and dat deuced bug were the sole words which escaped his lips during the journey for my own part i had charge of a couple of dark lanterns while legrand contented himself with the scarabus which he carried attached to the end of a bit of whipcord twirling it to and fro with the air of a conjurer as he went when i observed this last plain evidence of my friend's aberration of mind i could scarcely refrain from tears i thought it best however to humour his fancy at least for the present or until i could adopt some more energetic measures with a chance of success in the meantime i endeavoured but all in vain to sound him in regard to the object of the expedition having succeeded in inducing me to accompany him he seemed unwilling to hold conversation upon any topic of minor importance and to all my questions vouchsafed no other reply than we shall see we crossed the creek at the head of the island by means of a skiff and ascending the high grounds on the shore of the mainland proceeded in a northwesterly direction through a tract of country excessively wild and desolate where no trace of a human footstep was to be seen legrand led the way with decision pausing only for an instant here and there to consult what appeared to be certain landmarks of his own contrivance upon a former occasion in this manner we journeyed for about two hours and the sun was just setting when we entered a region infinitely more dreary than any yet seen it was a species of tableland near the summit of an almost inaccessible hill densely wooded from base to pinnacle and interspersed with huge crags that appeared to lie loosely upon the soil and in many cases were prevented from precipitating themselves into the valleys below merely by the support of the trees against which they reclined deep ravines in various directions gave an air of still sterner solemnity to the scene the natural platform to which we had clambered was thickly overgrown with brambles through which we soon discovered that it would have been impossible to force our way but for the scythe and jupiter by direction of his master proceeded to clear for us a path to the foot of an enormously tall tulip tree which stood with some eight or ten oaks upon the level and far surpassed them all and all other trees which i had ever seen in the beauty of its foliage and form in the wide spread of its branches and in the general majesty of its appearance when we reached this tree legrand turned to jupiter and asked him if he thought he could climb it the old man seemed a little staggered by the question and for some moments made no reply at length he approached the huge trunk walked slowly around it and examined it with minute attention when he had completed his scrutiny he merely said yes massa jump climb many tree he ebba see in he life then up with you as soon as possible 
for it will soon be too dark to see what we are about. "'How far must go up, Massa?' inquired Jupiter. "'Get up the main trunk first, and then I will tell you which way to go. And here, stop, take this beetle with you.' "'De bug, Massa Will, de ghoul bug!' cried the negro, drawing back in dismay. "'What for must tow de bug way up de tree? D N. if I do!' "'If you are afraid, Jup, a great big negro like you, to take hold of a harmless little dead beetle, why, you can carry it up by the string. But if you do not take it up with you in some way, I shall be under the necessity of breaking your head with a shovel. "'What de matter now, Massa?' said Jup, evidently shamed into compliance. "'Always want for to raise fuss with old nigger. Was only fun in anyhow. Me fear de bug? What I cared for de bug!' Here he took cautiously hold of the extreme end of the string, and, maintaining the insect, as far from his person as circumstances would permit, prepared to ascend the tree. In youth, the tulip tree, or Liriodendron tulipferum, the most magnificent of American foresters, has a trunk peculiarly smooth, and often rises to a great height without lateral branches, but in its riper age the bark becomes gnarled and uneven, while many short limbs make their appearance on the stem. Thus the difficulty of ascension, in the present case, lay more in semblance than in reality. Embracing the huge cylinder as closely as possible, with his arms and knees, seizing with his hands some projections, and resting his naked toes upon others, Jupiter, after one or two narrow escapes from falling, at length wriggled himself into the first great fork, and seemed to consider the whole business as virtually accomplished. The risk of the achievement was, in fact, now over, although the climber was some sixty or seventy feet from the ground. "'Which way must go now, Massa Will?' he asked. "'Keep up the largest branch.' the one on this side, said Legrand. The negro obeyed him promptly, and apparently with but little trouble, ascending higher and higher, until no glimpse of his squat figure could be obtained through the dense foliage which enveloped it. Presently his voice was heard in a sort of halloo. "'How much fudder is got for go?' "'How high up are you?' asked Legrand. "'Eber so fur replied the negro, can see de sky through de top of de tree. Never mind the sky, but attend to what I say. Look down the trunk and count the limbs below you on this side. How many limbs have you passed? One, two, three, four, five. I done pass five big limb, massa, pon this side. Then go one limb higher. In a few minutes the voice was heard again announcing that the seventh limb was attained. "'Now jump!' cried Legrand, evidently much excited. "'I want you to work your way out upon that limb as far as you can. If you see anything strange, let me know.' By this time, what little doubt I might have entertained of my poor friend's insanity was finally put at rest. I had no alternative but to conclude him stricken with lunacy." and I became seriously anxious about getting him home. While I was pondering upon what was best to be done, Jupiter's voice was again heard. "'Moss feared for to venture pon dis limb very far. Tis dead limb putty much all the way.' "'Did you say it was a dead limb, Jupiter?' cried Legrand in a quavering voice. "'Yes, Massa.' Him dead as de doornail done up for sartin, done departed dis here life. What in the name of heaven shall I do? asked the grand, seemingly in the greatest distress. Do, said I, glad of an opportunity to interpose a word. Why come home and go to bed? Come now, there's a fine fellow. It's getting late, and besides, you remember your promise. Jupiter! 
cried he, without heeding me in the least. Do you hear me? Yes, Massa Will, hear you ever so plain. Try the wood well, then, with your knife, and see if you think it is very rotten. Him rotten, Massa, sure enough, replied the negro, in a few moments. But not so very rotten as mot be. Mot venture out little way pon de limb by myself, dat's true. By yourself? What do you mean? Why, I mean de bug. Dis berry heavy bug. Spose I drop him down fuss, and den de limb won't break wid just a weight of one nigger. You infernal scoundrel! cried Legrand, apparently much relieved. What do you mean by telling me such nonsense as that? As sure as you drop that beetle, I'll break your neck. Look here, Jupiter, do you hear me? Yes, massa, needn't holler at poor nigger dat style. Well, now listen, if you will venture out on the limb as far as you think safe, and not let go the beetle, I'll make you a present of a silver dollar as soon as you get down. I'm Gwen, Massa Will, deed I is, replied the negro very promptly. Most out to the end now. Out to the end? Here fairly screamed Legrand. Do you say you are out to the end of the limb? Soon be to the end, Massa. Oh, look a la mercy. What is this here upon the tree? Well, cried Legrand, highly delighted. What is it? Why, tain't nothing but a skull. Somebody been left him head up de tree, and de crows done gobble every bit of de meat off. A skull, you say. Very well, how is it fastened to the limb? What holds it on? Sure enough, massa. Must look. Why, dis very curious circumstance, pon my word. Dere's a great big nail in de skull, what fastens ob it on to de tree. Well, now, Jupiter, do exactly as I tell you. Do you hear? Yes, massa. Pay attention, then. Find the left eye of the skull. Hum, ho, dat's good. Why, dere ain't no eye left at all. Curse your stupidity. Do you know your right hand from your left? Yes, I knows dat, knows all bout dat. Tis my left hand which I chops to wood with. To be sure, you are left-handed, and your left eye is on the same side as your left hand. Now, I suppose you can find the left eye of the skull, or the place where the left eye has been. Have you found it? Here was a long pause. At length, the negro asked, Is the left eye of the skull upon the same side as the left hand of the skull, too? Cause the skull ain't got not a bit of a hand at all. Never mind. I got the left eye now. Here, the left eye. What must I do with it? Let the beetle drop through it, as far as the string will reach. But be careful and not let go your hold of the string. All dat done, Massa Will. Mighty easy ting for to put de bug through de hole. Look out for him dare below. During this colloquy, no portion of Jupiter's person could be seen. But the beetle, which he had suffered to descend, was now visible at the end of the string, and glistened like a globe of burnished gold in the last rays of the setting sun, some of which still faintly illumined the eminence upon which we stood. The scarabus hung quite clear of any branches, and, if allowed to fall, would have fallen at our feet. Legrand immediately took the skies, and cleared with it a circular space, three or four yards in diameter, just beneath the insect, and having accomplished this, ordered Jupiter to let go the string and come down from the tree. Driving a peg with great nicety into the ground at the precise spot where the beetle fell, my friend now produced from his pocket a tape measure. Fastening one end of this at that point of the trunk of the tree which was nearest the peg, he unrolled it 
till it reached the peg and thence further unrolled it in the direction already established by the two points of the tree and the peg for the distance of fifty feet jupiter clearing away the brambles with the scythe at the spot thus attained a second peg was driven and about this as a centre a rude circle about four feet in diameter described now taking a spade himself and giving one to jupiter and one to me legrand begged us to set about digging as quickly as possible to speak the truth i had no especial relish for such amusement at any time and at that particular moment would willingly have declined it for the night was coming on and i felt much fatigued with the exercise already taken but i saw no mode of escape and was fearful of disturbing my poor friend's equanimity by a refusal could i have depended indeed upon jupiter's aid i would have had no hesitation in attempting to get the lunatic home by force but i was too well assured of the old negro's disposition to hope that he would assist me under any circumstances in a personal contest with his master i made no doubt that the latter had been infected with some of the innumerable southern superstitions about money buried and that his fantasy had received confirmation by the finding of the scarabus or perhaps by jupiter's obstinacy in maintaining it to be a bug of real gold a mind disposed to lunacy would readily be led away by such suggestions especially if chiming in with favorite preconceived ideas and then i called to mind the poor fellow's speech about the beetle's being the index of his fortune upon the whole i was sadly vexed and puzzled but at length i concluded to make a virtue of necessity to dig with a good will and thus the sooner to convince the visionary by ocular demonstration of the fallacy of the opinion he entertained the lanterns having been lit we all fell to work with a zeal worthy a more rational cause and as the glare fell upon our persons and implements i could not help thinking how picturesque a group we composed and how strange and suspicious our labors must have appeared to any interloper who by chance might have stumbled upon our whereabouts we dug very steadily for two hours little was said and our chief embarrassment lay in the yelpings of the dog who took exceeding interest in our proceedings he at length became so obstreperous that we grew fearful of his giving the alarm to some stragglers in the vicinity or rather this was the apprehension of legrand for myself i should have rejoiced at any interruption which might have enabled me to get the wanderer home the noise was at any length very effectually silenced by jupiter who getting out of the hole with a dogged air of deliberation tied the brute's mouth up with one of his suspenders and then returned with a grave chuckle to his task when the time mentioned had expired we had reached a depth of five feet and yet no signs of any treasure became manifest a general pause ensued and i began to hope that the farce was at an end legrand however although evidently much disconcerted wiped his brow thoughtfully and recommenced we had excavated the entire circle of four feet diameter and now we slightly enlarged the limit and went to the farther depth of two feet still nothing appeared the gold seeker whom i sincerely pitied at length clambered from the pit with the bitterest disappointment imprinted upon every feature and proceeded slowly and reluctantly to put on his coat which he had thrown off at the beginning of his labor in the meantime i made no remark jupiter at a signal from his master began to gather up his tools this done and the dog having been unmuzzled we turned in profound silence toward home we had taken perhaps a dozen steps in this direction when with a loud oath legrand strode up to jupiter and seized him by the collar the astonished negro opened his eyes and mouth to the fullest extent let fall the spades and fell upon his knees 
"'You scoundrel!' said Legrand, hissing out the syllables from between his clenched teeth. "'You infernal black villain! Speak, I tell you! Answer me this instant, without prevarication! Which, which is your left eye?' "'Oh, my golly, Massa Will, ain't dis here my left eye for sartin?' roared the terrified Jupiter, placing his hand upon his right organ of vision, and holding it there with a desperate pertinency, as if in immediate dread of his master's attempt at a gouge. "'I thought so! I knew it! Hurrah!' vociferated Legrand letting the negro go and executing a series of curvets and carousels much to the astonishment of his valet who arising from his knees looked mutely from his master to myself and then from myself to his master come we must go back said the latter the game's not up yet and he again led the way to the tulip tree jupiter said he when we reached its foot come here was the skull nailed to the limb with a face outward or with a face to the limb de face was out massa so dan de crows could get at de eyes good without any trouble well then was it this eye or that through which you dropped the beetle here legrand touched each of jupiter's eyes "'Twas dis eye, massa, de lef eye, just as you tell me, and here it was, his right eye, that the negro indicated. "'That will do. We must try it again.'" End of section 10